Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Comic Book Chronicles. I am your host, Rydicat. You can find me at Rydicat on Twitter. You can find me at CB Caps on Instagram and News News Need on Twitter. With Columbia down the way. Which, by the way, if you do go to CB Caps, you'll find that they'll put up the, a couple of new ones, uh, new joints up there, uh, including something neither one of us has read, but we found out about. Anyway, uh, and on the sound effects you have heard uh, come from none other than our man in Brooklyn, one agent underscore 70 on Twitter, Instagram, and threads. What's up, everybody? Co hosting from the Borough of Kings back in the, command the captain seat. Represent to the I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. That reminds me of something I was going to uh, mention to you before the show, but I'll do it uh, later. Um, you can find this here podcast on the Coastal Podcast, Old Slither Podcast Network, the CSPN.us. Do it today. Uh, you can also find us in your podcast perusal place of choice, whether it be Google Play, Google, uh, Apple iTunes, excuse me, um, aka Apple Podcasts, Google Play, all that kind of good jazz, Spotify, and the Cultures of Podcast Network SoundCloud page. That I just said that I'm just calling all kind of whatever tonight. <laughs> Make sure to click like, subscribe, and leave us all the positive five star reviews, especially on Apple Podcasts. That real, that's really where it matters. I'm actually trying to press for time because we don't want to on here all night uh because of reasons but uh so yeah we're just gonna get right into it folks because we've got a packed show first off we're going to start off with talking about uh bad batch season three episode 13 into the breach dear friends yes into the breach so i'm trying to remember what happened because i actually remember i watched this timely so it's been several days. <laughs> yeah, which I mean, which is probably just as well because I, I watched it a couple of days ago myself, and you know we don't even though we're recording not on a Thursday and record on a, on a Saturday, still don't want to you know spoil it for too many folks. Even though it's getting to the point to where I was like, you know what, people have seen it by this time, they're going to see it, and by the time it, this gets out in audio form, but basically. um well, we know Omega's been snatched again or has gone willingly again. So we, we catch up with what's going on there. Uh, the rest of the Bad Batch has gotten a plan together with the help of uh, that, that ex-Imperial uh, to try Grandpa. to find, the, yeah, to try to find their way to uh, Tantus or, or I keep wanting to call it Tetanus, but I know that's not the, <laughs> that's not the name of the place. Basically to where, um, to where Omega is. And, you know, they, they have enacted another plan that once again seems like is depending on a couple of different variables <laughs> right i'm starting to remember now a few of the details right. as i myself echo um right the always the, the plan that is always enacted in star wars always involved there's it almost always involves somebody disguising them, themselves as imperials always and yep. you know that it, it it it's true here in this instance as well obviously it's a it's a, not as hard for the clone you know for clone force 99 because they already have imperial-esque armor but it's just another uh another let's impersonate a bunch of imperials to get into the base and and and, and get us uh you know either sensitive information or a way in or a way out things like that so mm -hmm. You know that 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 obviously goes on, um, but yeah, there, there's a couple of um, exciting sequences in this uh, episode, specifically one involving um, some, let's say, uh, time sensitive movements by the batch as they're trying to. Uh, piggyback a ride as it were right. and another kind of suspenseful sequence involves 
Omega in uh, while she's in um, the midst of a plan to try to get out of where she's being held on Tantus again. <laughs> right, right. But this time with the help of the uh, of the four sensitive kids. Right. So, which again is, is as I just said, said, is a plan that we have seen in 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 the Star Wars projects past, specifically in in the uh, Filoni verse. So, not saying it's a bad thing, but just saying, hey, you know, it's it's a it's it's a thing that has happened before. <laughs> yeah. that, that continues to happen. So, um, and yeah, the the plan kind of goes a certain way, that, and that's pretty much all we could say at this point because there was a good chance that there was always the chance and just like in episodes past that where it's like well part of this plan was just going to go tits up and and, and not work out mm-hmm. or does work out you know depending on how you know depending on how it's played so how did it play out hey you had to, if you hadn't watched it yourself you'll find you can watch it you will uh you'll find out when you watch it but we're definitely going headlong into the last couple of episodes, which I'm still not, actually not in, entirely sure. Like I said, I thought I saw to where the last the couple of which we are upon are going to be the back to back. So the next week could potentially be um, the last week of Bad Batch with a two okay. episode uh, issue, um, two episode arc. But like I said, I'm halfway certain of that like right. i do remember seeing something about it but i haven't seen anything since right. so right. um it's just a matter of that being the case all right so that would be 14 and 15 right, right. you know back to back right Got which it. actually i'm looking on idmdb and that is not and granted that could be also different also because like sometimes you know you know it doesn't have all the pertinent information it needs but this is saying it's it's going to be uh, one episode next week. Mm-hmm. So, which means that the, the last episode is going to be on May 1st. So, that's IMDb. You take it for what it is. I mean, they, they, you know, they would be likely to get certain information like that ahead, you know, uh, uh, in enough time. But sometimes, you know, you kind of got to go to with what, the, what, you, what you got. So, I might be wrong about the two episode next week. So, which? Okay. You know. well, I mean, we'll see. You know, yeah. that's all we can do is just be patient and see. Right. And, like, and if that's the case, then, like, then they must have either, you know, either either I must sell wrong or they decided not to do that because they did do two episodes, like, a couple of weeks back. Mm-hmm. So, and I think they did do it at the beginning of, of the season, so which kind of, you know, could go either way. So, either way. But the episode was, in itself, was, was still, you know, was still quality. So, uh... Either way, enjoy it while we still got it. Next up, uh, we're going to talk about X-Men 97 Season 1, Episode 6, which is called Life, Death, Part 2. Right. And what's interesting about this is that, you know, obviously Roddy Cat had seen the, uh, the episode title and had assured myself, because I had not seen this, that they were going to do a continuation of the Life, Death story Interestingly enough, though, the this life death story happened to kind of wrap in some of the fall of the mutant story of Forge and Storm as well, a little bit, you know, with the adversary. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was pretty interesting that they would adapt it the way they adapted it. The rest of this episode, what was in this in the rest of this episode? So they did a not necessarily a oh that's thing. right with the with the space the right. space with with yes with uh, hey we found out what happened to uh, well not what happened because we kind of knew but we 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 see what's the goings on with a certain professor and his uh and his uh would have been soon would be soon three betrothed uh, bird lady friend right <laughs> so. So they did, like I was saying, they kind of did a similar thing to what they did with the first, uh, I guess, part one of uh, Life, Death, except for that was actually two different, that was technically like two different um, stories, you know, as opposed to them cutting back and forth like they were doing with this one. So you had the the, the Storm Forge stuff in, in this uh uh, and this one interspersed with the stuff that's going on with, um, Lord alert, Charles Xavier and Landra. Mm-hmm. 
um, you know, and like I said, stuff we kind of figured was going to be the case at, at or well, some people figured it was going to be the case during the course of this season um, is it, probably heading towards that way as, as the way it's looking. Um, yeah, the life stuff stuff was, was pretty good. The whole, I, it now also kind of makes me giggle a little bit because if I'm mistake, not mistaken, did there, was there not two f- storm figures in that X-Men 97, um, Marvel legends batch? No. Or was, am I thinking of, a, of a, am I thinking of another wave? There was a wave that was had like the white suit and the black suit, but it wasn't the next man 97 one. No, 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 no. They did the white boat. Oh, um, oh whatchamacallit? No, no, no. I just, I pulled on my, uh, my mic stand, my mm. mic, uh, just a little bit. I got to refasten it. But what I will say though, is they did do basically like a reissue of the storm with the Mohawk with right. the, with, but in a white costume, right. the white Jimmy costume. That's what was in this most recent wave. Um, interestingly, they, you know, the uh, minor spoiler alert, they re- they kind of introduce, because I don't think they ever introduced it in the animated series, the original, like, Cockrum look. Right. The original Storm look from uh, Giant Size X-Men number one. Right. And they introduced that here in this issue, and that's actually really interesting that they did that, because maybe that's, you know, that's a, that's, you know, fodder for another Marvel Legends reissue, right? Right. They might oh, reissue. They might reissue that uh, that action figure, which was like a Target exclusive, if I remember. Because mm-hmm. I remember both myself and Roddy Cat ended up getting that, right? And um, I'll say that also, interestingly, that um, seeing the is it, so the Professor X that we see in this issue in this episode is reminiscent of the cover appearance and and his reemergence in Uncanny X-Men circa 275 that famous cover that Jim Lee cover that um that I know that they put out Marvel Legends for mm-hmm. that I recently just got so maybe there maybe there's still some hope that they'll reissue that no that they'll issue a Professor X in this armor look right with this gold helmet and purple cape mm-hmm. So that we can actually re redo, you know, we can actually present the um, the what you call it, the uh, the cover in its entirety, because now we can't, we we can do that with the X Men, but not with Xavier. Right. the The weird thing about this episode to to me was, and and it probably has more to do with the the animation than more than anything, but they got Xavier looking kind of, and no pun intended, sinister, and I don't mean like Mister Sinister, but like he just looks kind of like when yeah, he's a little bit older, but he just looks a little like he could like he just go could go evil anytime. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like oh, you mean more of the art than the animation. Yes. Like yes. The, I, when you say animation, I think of the movement. But yeah, I, well, I, yeah. I def- see yeah. what you mean. I see what you mean. Like the, the way they depict him in the art is definitely he seems a little bit more craggly, you know, like, you know, what I mean, like mm-hmm. a little bit more rough. Than, right. Like they got a whole bunch of more shadow on his face that the, yeah, the kind of. Yeah plays on yeah. them and it's like huh i get it i get it i definitely agree so but outside of that like the you know the episode's still good for what it is you you um you know <laughs> you get some good old-fashioned um <laughs> you get a good old-fashioned civil war going on and and not in the uh, um marvel well not in right, in the G-R- traditional R- sense right in the traditional sense i should say not in the marvel sense <laughs> Although also, but you know, still yet. Um, where is it leading? Don't know. Um, well, we do know in, in one way, shape, or form, but we don't necessarily get any payoff on, which we weren't expected to uh, get any payoff on that last episode. Um, however, there is a, a change in the uh, the title treatment, not the title treatment, but uh, in the. Um, the lineup treatment in the title, I will say that much. Right. Which actually kind of made me laugh for a second. It was like, dang, <laughs> it didn't waste no time, huh? Nope. <laughs> so, um, but that's the kind of been the thing with X-Men Center 97, because like, especially with the, with the, uh, the way the, um, you know, the, uh, the opening treatment kind of goes, it's like, yeah, they, they make these changes here and there and keep some old stuff and kind of, 
go from there because uh, apparently in the, even in the first couple of episodes there was some stuff that uh, some people missed uh, myself included that may have may have been the case unless i go back and watch it which you know hey eh. so um but yeah that is um that is x-men 97 um uh, i um i just despite kind of reading ahead and, and uh, catching this episode i can't remember what the, the next episode uh title is going to be about which is fine <laughs> so because i think we got what like four or more episodes left i think yeah a 10 episode order mm-hmm. but obviously it's come out that they've already finished or or at least in the midst of uh season two right right like uh, the, a bunch of it's finished with the exception of something so some right. processing right. i guess so there's more to come right and I think are there are, might be already working on season three. Is all I heard rum, rumblings of them. So I did hear that. Yeah, which is good. You know, hey, more of it. Maybe hopefully we'll get like a uh, a bigger episode count. Also, um, we'll see. Yeah, but we don't know. That being said, if we can go over into you, you good over there? You still working on? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing some, some some impromptu construction on my desk. You know, like you gotta love it when like things decide to when when the the gremlins decide to escape the computer. Right. You know, the gremlins decide to escape the computer, and I'm like, wait, what's going on? Here? You know? <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah, I was about to say if you could just carry on with the uh, the comics. And just start the first few. Start the first comic. Oh yeah, uh, which is pretend, where... don't pretend to hit the uh, sound effect. <laughs> well, you know the 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 um the the sounds you're making are coming through, so we can work with that. But the first, exact, it's the construction sounds. Yeah, the first. So we're gonna get into the comics uh, of the week, starting off with Roxon presents Thor number one. I guess it's a one shot. You have to. <laughs> we have to. I mean, no, but we might as well get it out of the way. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, listen, I'm teasing, but I'm kind of not. Yeah, and and for folks who have been around uh, the Combo Chronicles for a good while, probably know, and a couple of them even agree with uh, Agent Seventy on why he has an issue with it. What he is, what the issue he has with this issue. Yep, and it has nothing to do. Well, well. I, I can't speak for him, uh, but it's less so of the art in some and some and more so in the way that it kind of not necessarily perfectly, but pretty well um captures what it's trying to do <laughs> to the point of um yeah, being being by Al Ewing, I will say have some fun with it, which I guess we uh, while while Agent Seven is still doing it, I'll go ahead and do the credits. Um, it, yeah, it, well, it what was... I was gonna say is, um, just before Roddy Cat jumped into the credits, I was gonna say there is far more meta commentary than I'm used to, right? And that is like the the the, the big, you know the like one big feature of this issue i can actually get to the credits but if you want to go ahead you have them on you have them on top okay well yeah i was gonna gonna mention mention the meta stuff too uh when i was gonna mention it but yeah written by al ewing pencils by greg land hence the hence the uh reason why agent 70 is uh groaning uh inks by jay lyston colors by frank darmada and letters by vcs joe sabino yeah he's the roddy cat saved me from having to say you know he who shall not be named as artist, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, obviously, we know that the uh, the idea behind this issue is that uh, Roxon and the Minotaur uh, have acquired the rights, the comic book publishing rights to Thor, and are in use are, and are using some as guardian magic provided by a certain enchantress in order to change the story change the narrative as it were literally and you can and you can sense where this is going um with um uh you know with the cover with the the concept behind this rocks on presenting thor Mm -hmm. and there are lots of real world uh parallels and analogs that uh, 
uh, Al Ewing draws upon and incorporates into the story. And with that, I will hand it off to Roddy Cat because I know he's going to want to talk about some of those. Well, I was I was going to say I'm, I'm gonna read from my notes and let me see if you agree with if with um, my assessments of this. Uh, what if Thor had a slightly different upbringing as a corporate shield? I mean, character from the boys. Kinda. Kinda, yeah. And I feel like that that kind of tells you a good bit about what is, I mean, if the name itself didn't, didn't uh, give you any kind of idea. It goes full on into that whole thing. Um, you know, to great effect and to enough of an effect to make you go, Ugh, I hate it. <laughs> I love so it, but I hate it. Exactly, because it reminds you of too much of the real world. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and some of the extremes that we could see sooner rather than later. That's mm-hmm. the worst part. Like mm-hmm. everything down to, what is it, the, the middleman software? I, I, was, I, I started cracking up. I was like, mm-hmm. seriously, that's where we're going. Right. <laughs> you have the, the, the Thor truck with the, uh, that you can only get in when you swipe a 20, <laughs> uh, a 20 sided password or a 20 character password and swipe your hammer. <laughs> right. 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 And it only gets nine miles to the gallon because it's completely made out of Uru. Right. You know? Exactly. Like that's just a little uh, of uh, uh, of what goes on in this, and to the point yeah, of it's. I was about to say it's too bad that uh, it would it would be even more timely if it was subject to a recall. Right. Shots fired. Right. <laughs> right. And um, using your you know insert rocks on rocks on app or rocks on you know everything in here is 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 rocks on related, including the food. You know the, yep. the the you know the it, um well, I guess I didn't I don't remember seeing any clothes but regardless pretty much every anything that gets brought up is is rock star related and it's like oh I hate it but yeah like Agent Seven said like yeah we could there is a point in the real world that we could see this sooner rather than level later but uh, yep. but like I said Al was having fun with it and and it was enjoyable on that but it was also still like I said, it was it was done well enough to where it's groaning to see yeah um so i guess it hits the mark and like eight to seventy said earlier you know it wasn't just that being but it was a, a whole lot of meta commentary sure. climate change is right exactly right yeah and that was actually the funny part where yeah the the bad guy of the story is actually spitting actual facts and it that's you know, presented as a lie. <laughs> yeah. That it's... and the characterizations of uh certain folks that are that are um that are in here that was following him was like, okay, that's funny. But also like yes, a corporate sponsored thing would actually make the the people trying to <laughs> like granted, making them all into sheep that are just following along any old thing you know, any old message, like, yeah, that's also a real world thing, but also making it that, hey, the bad guys trying to make the earth better are the bad guys, or excuse me, the good guys trying to make the earth better are the bad guys. To be fair, mm-hmm. there are some people that are, you know, or certain things that, that act in a not so great way. We, we're, you know, you know, <laughs> I don't want to bring up Peter in here, but I did. Um, but yeah, so it's even presented to where down so so back in the day, uh and Agent Seventy can 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 attest to this. If you're old enough, you can remember the fact to where and I guess I don't know if, if well physical copies don't I don't remember if physical copies have as much as they used to, but there was like an you know, you had a couple of pages of story and then at the bottom of the uh, of the, the second or third page you have continue it after the second or third page because they have a couple of pages of ads. Yep, I remember that. And this did that every pretty much before, right. I was it's a little bit before my time, hmm. uh, like my regular reading time. But I hmm. know that if you got a couple back issues from like the late seventies, even the hmm. earliest eighties, you hmm. would see a lot of that. Right. So I was kind of halfway expecting a fr- hostess fruit pie <laughs> hmm. ad page or the one page full of gizmos and junk for kids that if you can, yep. you know, John from Johnson, I guess or what it was or something, or whatever the company was that did all that stuff. Or sea monkeys or something. I don't know. It was it was, was going to be something, but 
there wasn't much of that, but you did still see the footnotes. And there was the one page that had the one ad, the corporate sponsored ad in it, uh, in his, which that was the part that I was, I was thinking about age of 70. Also, I was like, Hmm, I wonder what he's, what is he's thinking about that page with that ad <laughs> with who's on it mm-hmm. specifically. But, um, but yeah, like I said, this is, this, uh, you know, this issue is what is, we've pretty much laid it all down there. Um, and this is apparently a one shot, um, which it we, is I a guess, one shot. yeah, which we knew it was going to be, but it, the way they even presented it felt like it, it there, I thought it was like, wait, are they actually doing another uh, issue of this? But no, you, you know, it's going back into the regular immortal Thor thing next, uh, next, uh, in the next issue. So I was like, okay. All right, I'm glad they all, you know, they did it as a one shot. You know, it's an option, I think, to get this if you are collecting Immortal Thor. Vodka and I were just talking about this. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's, it's certainly not required reading. It obviously helps fill in some of the uh, context of why uh, Dario Agar and, and, and as the Minotaur and the head of Roxxon is doing what he's doing in the main series so it does pay off but you know if you like me are not a fan of greg land's art you can probably s- skip this and still get the gist of what's going on yeah but hey it's it's still a fun read you know um you know, and and not everybody's susceptible to the uh the artist as a as agent 70 is so you might be all right with it <laughs> boo greg land anyway, next up <laughs> That being said, we're going to move over into the next book, which is Avengers Twilight number five. Avengers Twilight number five is written by Chip Zdarsky with art by Daniel Acuna and letters by our favorite lettering Paisan VCs Joe Caramagna. We are hurtling towards the end of Avengers mm-hmm. Twilight. This is the penultimate issue of this limited series, and we are starting to see the culmination of the plans put in place by the big bad guy in this series who's not exactly what you think but is exactly what you think ultimately we also have lots of um things coming full circle as it were you know we're getting a lot of um gaps filled in and i had a feeling because I think I had seen the cover for the last issue and I had kind of filled in the gap of what H day actually stood for. Mm-hmm. But, um, I kind of like that, you know, we, you know, that, that particular somewhat dangling plot thread was filled in right at the end of this issue. Mm-hmm. So, uh, with that, I'll hand it off to write cat. Yeah. I mean, there's really not much else to say, you know, we got a couple of, rev- uh, uh, we got a revelation, uh, at the end of last issue of which is shaking somebody shook somebody at the beginning of this ep- ep- uh, issue, but still went along with it. And yeah, I mean, this is, it is the penultimate end, uh, issue where things are kind of, you know, all of the pieces go, are going towards the, the end game of this. And, um, um, we get a, you know, I guess the only other thing I, I will say is that, uh, we got a version of. I guess the Avengers version of fastball special in here, or in some way the the Hawkeye Ant Man special uh, fastball special in a way. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got a we had a we had a father of some um, tete a tete <laughs> in a way. Um, up on uh, into this, and the part that I really really liked that that kind of makes this a potential click of the week was that um a certain line that was uh was said. Um, by Cap, like he said, uh, "Hey, oh, uh, Ultron, we've routinely beat him up too." I'm like, yeah, right. Cap. Talk <laughs> <laughs> your shit, I, I Cap. Kinda, I kind of laugh subsequent to that, mm-hmm. where Luke Cage is like, "Man, I always have to go save yes. Cap's butt." I was like, "Wait a second, <laughs> did you really?" <laughs> yeah, I was like, I don't remember too many times of that being the case, but all right, Luke, can you know, talk your shit. Right. I was like, yeah, that's, that's exactly my thought process, process too. I was like, really? Okay, you go on then, you know? I mean, there was probably some mighty Avengers times where that might have happened. I don't know, but yeah, I was yeah, like, uh, I, but I don't remember anything. So, but it was, I, I agree with you there. I was like, yeah, that was pretty funny. 
and actually that had me had me thinking about it. I'm like, I hope they're not gonna kill off Luke. <laughs> Cause I feel like they're just like, okay, if he's getting into this and knowing, you know, like are they just gonna kill him? Like not just saying saying this story has any stakes with what's going on currently in the actual universe. Like this is a future you it might as well be a what if right. or, or or an else world story. Um but yeah, I don't know. I, I'm hoping they don't do that to that to that old man. <laughs> yes. But yeah, like uh, Agent Seventy said, yeah, we found out uh, what the the real deal with uh, H Day is, and I guess we got confirmation on another character's uh, status in this. Although they could pull a last minute, it's like, oh no, this character's still alive and was just biding their time or or something like that. But we don't know. Either way, hey, it was a good um good issue, and um I you know. Skulltron besmirching the name of Jarvis is never going to, uh, you know, leave me in a good place. Oh, yeah. So. All right, folks. Next up, we are going to Skulltron. Yeah. I, even though they, this, this, this issue kind of was like, well, I'm not, it's not technically Skulltron, but we're just going to keep saying it. I'm just going to keep saying it anyway. Despite because mm-hmm. something happens along those lines where, of course, there was a, a sudden but inevitable betrayal. You know, in that situation. Oh. Um, but nevertheless, the next issue, the next thing we're going to talk about is Fall of the House of X number four. Fall of the House of X number four is written by Jerry Duggan with art by Lucas Vernack and Jethro Morales. Colors by Brian Valenza and letters by VCs Travis Lanham. So in a sense, the the end game of the fall of Krakoa or the fall of the House of X overall, uh, you know, is it, kind of reaching its crescendo. And my biggest complaint in this issue is that there's a lot going on and it seems relatively disjointed. Even though we know what is ultimately what they're ultimately moving towards is the it's it's the final battle and dealing with um orcus and, and and what their big plans are not necessarily orcus but with the sentinels and sentinel city right and you know we know we understand that the the, the tables have been turned at orcus by the by the by the machines we understand there are a few other things in play but it just i had a tough time reading this issue and i'm going to hand it off to roddy cap because that's exactly what I asked of him whether or not he had a tough time reading this issue when uh, we were in our pre-production meeting. Right. So, and I guess, yeah. And in that talk, so agent 70 had read a book from this week that I had not had a chance to read yet, which is, I think fueling part of, um, you know, why it felt disjointed to him and I had not read. And I, as I said to him, then I'm like, maybe when I read that, it, it might come to, to be the case. But since I've already read, this is, you know, it is what it is. I did not feel that same disjointedness with the, or, or, or at least as much as he did, because there like, there was a part that was like, okay, wait, wasn't somebody else around here that we were talking about um, that was involved with this part of that. But, uh, but I guess there were probably someplace else or ended up being somewhere else. We don't know. But, um, but yeah, this is pretty much, Hey, the big battle started Think there, as I just said, it's like, yeah, we're, we're pretty much coming to the end of the Krakoran era and everything's coming together all fast and furious. Like, um, where like I said, all of the pieces are kind of coming into place, uh, and they're coming from all over the place because yeah, there are certain stuff that, you know, one of us has read where the other one hadn't read that that things might be coming up from and it's like, well, wait, where did this happen? Or whatever the case may be. Or even in that, like he just said, said, it's like, well, something, as he said before the show, like something from this other book seemed like it's playing against what's playing off in this book. What is that? Right. In this book and in, uh, what you'll call it, in um, Rise of the Powers of Ten. Right. Right, Which because means. you know, obviously, they're all sort of interacting with each other, and I think trying to figure out, you know, where we are and what's going on, it's it's just a little like everything is just a little disjointed to me, a little, right? And it doesn't appear that even though so fall fall of the house is like this is the last issue of this, 
if I'm not mistaken, right? Because there's four issues each, which means it's this. And, yeah, which means it's this, and then it's Rise in, in in like two weeks, and then whatever other Xbox could kind of close it out their stuff um, in the next few weeks. Matter of fact, when I saw, when I looked at the checklist at the end of uh, fall, uh, it goes into uh, the relaunch, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's saying that, hey, there is going to be some stuff that's um that's going to survive and carry on into uh into the relaunch which it there seems to be some rumblings of that being possible but we don't know that for certain that being said i say all that to say that we got rise coming up and it doesn't seem to me that rise is just going to cap off the story like right. maybe the story is going to end off in like x-men proper or or something it definitely shouldn't be in, in, in like Iron uh, Iron Man, which I know that is a book that is still, that is at the end of the checklist. So we will have to see how and or when they close out. Cause and I think they, they did mention what the X-Men Forever book is also uh, still in play during the course of this. But it doesn't seem likely that that would be there would end it all. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like, well, they shouldn't be expecting people to read that book even despite what's going on, but we don't know. Like normally we would have been like, cause we know coming from coming off of high spots, like, well, okay, well, rise pretty much caps off this part that the, the end of the part and then just gets into the pro story proper. But since we're at the tail end of that, I don't know. It seems weird to, to where we know where it's going to end proper. Um, but also we kind of felt that way with uh, the gang war recently. So and that's, that might be a failing of Marvel if that's the case again. So, uh, but with that, unless eight to seven has something else uh, about fall, we can get to the last issue or the last book we, we got uh, in common. No, no, that's it. All that's right. It. Spectacular Spider-Man number two. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Gotcha. Spectacular Spider-Man, Spider-Man number mm -hmm. two is written by Greg Weissman with pencils by Umberto Ramos inks by Victor Olathaba, colors by Edgar Delgado, and letters by our favorite lettering Patan, VC's Joe Caramagna. So this issue is maybe not the most direct continuation of the previous issue, but it's pretty close because a couple of things get picked up from the previous issue, and we're basically like a week later, or maybe like a week and a half, two weeks later, into the story with another visit to this version of central perk is very friends like right it's a mixture of friends and cheers right to which they call out directly <laughs> right literally call out directly to cheers where everybody knows your name it's a it's a direct call out which is kind and... of funny but before he says that i thought that i thought that thought at the beginning of the book mm -hmm. but then but then it goes on and gets it gets actually said but right kind of and i know that the you know the, obviously the 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 uh, the reference, the, v the vague reference to Cheers is in the first issue. It is. It very much is. Mm -hmm. Right? And, you know, it's just obviously more, much more overt in this one. Um, we do get a little bit of a guest appearance from uh, uh, a, 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 a Thor supporting character. <laughs> uh, it was kind of cool. I was like, ooh, are we going to get that character uh, showing up as well? Let's see. Um one of the fun things in this is to see like these little vignettes, like you see a character, a supporting character uh, in Daredevil show up and Daredevil show up. And you're like, oh, there's something going on here that is playing into the greater story here. And we're going to see much more of that uh, uh, going forward. I, I kind of got a little sidetracked in this issue because there's a lot of things going on uh there's an appearance by i guess you could call him a spidey villain in the sewers oh. i kind of lost track of this whole like cloning thing that was going on with that character and then a bunch of humans showed up i'm like where did you guys come from in the sewers <laughs> right? right so you know like very mild spoilers there, folks. And I'm going to hand it off to Roddy Cat with that one because I was kind of scratching my head uh, when I got to that point in the issue. No, and I get it because I, I was 
kind of there too because so we get one of Miles' supporting characters also shows up in this and hey i think we've said it in just before we, there's there can't there aren't too many spider books that you can have without a clone showing up here and there right and, and everything agent 70 just mentioned has to do with had to do with clones including the what i just mentioned um so yeah but we also s- seem like we the the bad guy may have been called out or at least of this first arc i i i should say um clone aside because we keep getting references to a place where where uh that is recruiting or quote unquote beta testers right uh and that is that is falling in line with what's going on in the overall um you know uh with what with what's going on with people uh, right. and the story that uh, the the spidey's haven't gotten a full wind of yet right but i think we know which character is going to be involved in that because of the name of the, the place exactly. or the game exactly so that's not that's not exactly uh uh a well kept secret at least from us the right. reader right unless it's a swerve it's you know i'd be impressed if it was but i doubt it Mm-hmm. Uh, but yes, uh, Agent Seventy is is on the money with that one. So it was like, okay, so where does that tie in? And, well, I guess that's going to tie in somehow, some way, with this other part where the, with the where these clones are showing up and uh, um, in in various ways. Well, I guess it, technically it does. Now that I think about it, because of, I guess if you put a couple of things that uh, together that happen in this issue, um is probably doing that and leading to, I guess, the collaboration between those two villains. I guess the, they both are spider villains at some point. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll see where that, sh- what, where that goes with here. You know, it's been a, it's been a fun, fun book for the, for the last couple of issues, you know, even if it is not in the world of uh, the, the series that it's kind of, kind of sort of named for, which I've been thinking about digging out. Well, actually, I don't have to go watch it on Disney Plus. But regardless, um, yeah, like, yeah, things. The, the the book continues to be fun. That's all I'll say about that. And we can push on. And with that, uh, we can go into rapid fire. All right, here we go. Rapid fire time. I ain't got time. To eat. All right, I'll take the lead on this. First up is Nightwing number 113. And believe it or not, apparently Nightwing number 113 is also the 300th issue of Nightwing, I guess, over the the course of its two runs. So congratulations to the character for, you know, for, for having 300 in legacy numbering issues. So... Interestingly about this is that the book is written by Tom Taylor, but with a two-page mini slash insert story or sequence written by Marv Wolfman. Um, The art on this book is by Danielle DiNiculo, but with those two pages scripted by Marv Wolfman, the art is done by, I think, regular cover artist, more often regular series artist, Bruno Redondo, but definitely cover artist. Colors on this book are by Adriano Lucas and letters are by Wes Abbott. So this issue really kind of is, is a little bit more of a setup issue. You know, it's, it's, it's an anniversary issue in the sense that you get lots of, uh, you know, character interactions you get, uh, in a sense you get, um, you know, some cool, uh, storylines being tied off and and updated and and being progressed but you know at the end of the day there's not a ton of action in this issue but you do get some great uh, moments between the robins nightwing and uh barbara gordon aka oracle aka batgirl so there are a lot of really great moments between the characters and that actually makes this this issue worthy of uh, being a candidate for click of the week. 
Next up is Captain Marvel number seven. It's written by Alyssa Wong with art by Jan Basil Dua, colors by Brian Valenza, and letters by VCs Ariana Mar. Interestingly, I read this issue because I wanted to see where Alyssa Wong was taking the Marvel family, the Marvel's version of the Marvel family, or the Marvel family, as it were. You know, this is not Billy Batson and all the people who yell out Shazam. Rather, it's Captain Marvel, a.k.a. Uh, Carol Danvers, and all of the descendants slash like extended family tree of uh marvell captain marvell the original captain marvel that includes janice vell that includes Lori l that includes um uh, uh not billy but um i forget the is it billy uh uh from uh, the young avengers the kree scroll um character oh uh, teddy Teddy. Teddy, I couldn't yeah. remember his. I couldn't remember his first name. I, I, I was like, "It's Hulkling." I know everything about him. I just don't remember his first name. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, and and and, uh, and um, Janice Vell throw in there with Phyla Vell also. Like I said, all the Vell, all the Marvels, uh, the 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 extended family, and I like that part of the story. They all, uh, Alyssa Wong also does a good job of. Uh, kind of resolving something that had been going on over the course of these seven issues, but then re like circling back to something that she introduced with the new character, um, uh, who, uh, who who's played a pretty big role in this uh, first seven issues. So this is this is a fun read. I think it's it's worth keeping up with. Next up is Dead X-Men number four. It's written by Steve Fox with art by David Baldion, Bernard Chang, and Vincenzo Caratu. Uh, colors are by Frank Martin and letters are by VCs Corey Petit. So I think, you know, I had a chance to take a look at some of the other issues in this fall of X storyline. And I think that Dead X-Men number four kind of falls into more of the rise of the powers of 10 story as opposed to the fall of the house of X. But I still, I'm still kind of still kind of lost as to how all this stuff is happening at the same time. And I could definitely use, you know, the reading guide that we have isn't great. Right. And publishing delays and dates being what they are still, it doesn't lend itself to being, to kind of putting together everything. I think that maybe it's just a, a, you know, the the volume of, of books that we read. It's just hard to keep track and keep everything straight in my head. But what's what, what's I think that the saving grace of this series is that we do end up following that new team of X Men that were so uh, so quickly dispatched at the Hellfire Gala. And it's kind of fun to see them in action. Next up is oh wait no that, that's it for me that's it for me. Hmm. I was about to, I was going to say shafted but yeah you you said it nicely nicer <laughs> <laughs> yeah I tried to be nicer yeah. I tried to be nice about it. Um, actually before I do my books um so uh, one shout out to Ron Glenn who's in the chat he's who um kind of I guess kind of agrees with me too and says that uh, he says yeah the pacing of the X books is hella rushed. Um, even Enigma wasn't uh, properly established as a big bad. Uh, he says he thinks uh, it's five issues of Rise and Fall, which yeah, I just confirmed it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we have so, one more of each. Right. It's. I mean, I still. I feel like I still stand. I mean, it's that makes it a little bit better to kind of close things out, but still right. kind of continue with. It still kind of still feels the same way, regardless. So, um, there's that. Uh, and with that, let me go on to my books really quickly with Star Trek number 19. Um, let's see. Written by Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing. Art by Megan Levins. Colors by Lee Luffridge. And letters by Clayton Cowles. Excuse me. So we basically find out 
um, what's going on with the character of Tiller, who at this point knew as a Vulcan officer in Starfleet. And we come to find out that he is not that in a way, shape or form. And that kind of is in service of seeking the help of Starfleet in trying to help save his people, which go back to an old uh, TOS meeting, let's just say, of a, a group of, um, uh, uh, of a, a group of people. Uh, and in this, they're needing help. And to which the Theseus, after some soul searching, and a little bit of a temper tantrum by one particular uh, junior officer who probably doesn't have any right leg to stand on on lying to folks uh you know they they opt for the mission uh and the said all um, junior officer also at the end of this issue uh let's just say gets recruited by a certain um a certain section uh, uh, of Starfleet or uh, Starfleet adjacent, I should say. Some would say the problem that the um the, the 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 Wetworks crew of the Starfleet of the Federation uh has approached her. Uh, to what end? Guess we will find out. And we also find out that there's one of the characters that kind of has a personal reason. Uh, to to go on this mission, having to do with a family which of course is the order of the day next up uh star trek mace window number three when do not window I, I i feel like i keep saying window every time i say that but i don't um uh, but uh issue number three of four written by mark bernardin pencils by george's jaunty uh inks by dexter vines colors by andrew dollhouse and letters by vc's joe caramania so it hasn't happened yet, but I'm expecting it, it, it might. But then again, who's to say? So this is a story set in kind of the, not necessarily the early days of Mace Windu, but this is definitely um, Clone Wars era, era obviously. Um, but probably sometime before the, the first movie, I would, I, would, I would say, if I remember correctly. Uh, but... He is on a mission to basically. Hey, this this almost feels like the the uh, the story of um, Formula Fifty One. If you watched that movie, coincidentally, that was starring um, Samuel L. Jackson. Coincidentally, but basically, there's a smuggler who ends up with um, the information about a certain formula formula that would make it so. Um, smugglers or anyone who had access to the technology would uh, be able to uh, have faster hyperdrive capabilities, which if the wrong people got their hands on it would be a, you know, would be a bad thing. If the good guys had it, then they potentially keep it out of the hands of the bad folks. So Mace was uh, uh, sent on this mission to find who the, the person who has it. And it did. And it is in the form of a, a smuggler named Azita Cruz whom they have had some adventures in the last couple of issues, including this one, uh, that is at the end of this, uh, getting into some bounty hunter trouble, uh, that was sent by a representative of a certain well-known hut. But at the end of this, they meet, um, a couple of other people who I guess here, they have their own reasons for, for find for for hunting down this person, or maybe the same reasons we don't. I'm not entirely sure, but these people kind of came out of nowhere, uh, in, in this book. So, and all the while, Mace and this uh this uh this smuggler are kind of getting to know each other. Come to find out, they're from the same planet, by the way. Um, which, you know, I feel like there's going to be a connection. There's there's already a connection there. If there's not going to be one made out of this, but it doesn't. You know, seeing this though, and this is the penultimate issue of this book, so I don't if there's going to be any kind of you know, will they, won't they? Granted, he's a Jedi, so it'll probably be more won't they, but longingly from afar, maybe want to <laughs> type of situation mm -hmm. going on there. But I can see it because the character's cool, 
anyway, next up, uh, Cobra Commander number four of five. There we go. Uh, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Andrea Milana, colors by Annalisa Leone, letters by uh, Russ Wooten. So, um, at the end of last issue, we find that uh, the Cobra Commander had gotten away from the Dreadnoughts, but he took one with them because he found out that um, the Dreadnoughts were kind of holding someone that has some information that the, co the Commander wants. Well, now that's been taken care of, and, uh, well, that in the course of this issue is kind of being taken care of, but not without um uh, the 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 person that cobra commander has in tow or the other way around i guess you could say wanting to complete his mission that person being nemesis enforcer of which there is a a little bit of a um you know a, a rid of a little bit of a dust up that happens in the course of this issue um i'm not going to tell you how it goes so i feel like you there's going to be another issue to this. So that kind of tells you right there how we went. <laughs> but it's also leading into, um, as I say, leading to the commander to kind of get on his, his greater mission. And it also leads him, as I say in my notes, to a man behind a certain planet named Company, who is also name checked at the end of this issue. Which who of whom also we know is going to have their own miniseries at some point soon in this universe. Uh, so yeah, there is that. Uh, next up is Moon Man number two. Oops, Moon Man number two. There we go. Written by a uh, script by Scott Miscuti, aka Kid Cudi, and Kyle Higgins, aka Kyle Higgins. Art by Marco Locati. Colors by Igor Monti. Letters by uh, Hassan Atsmane Elao. So, the art in this book is still kind of rough. Um, and I say that right off the bat because uh, there are a couple of points in here to where it's just it's like, okay, I, this is probably a stylistic choice as, as, as to why they're doing it. But yeah, there's a lot going on here and it's kind of, kind of, uh, rough looking to me that means somebody else could could say oh you know this is like yeah this is high art or something like that but now nah, they're it it kind of makes a couple of issues a couple of pages kind of hard to, to parse out in a way uh and if you i could point to them but i'm not going to do it but the uh the crux of is is hey we got this dude who was a part of a mission to go back to the moon with this other crew, this might sound sound kind of familiar in the, in uh, in, in respect to other in, in other publishers, but uh, something in that mission goes wrong. They lose some time, but they end up coming back. One of which, which is our main character, ends up uh, having powers out of the deal. And in this particular issue, um, after what happens at the end of the last issue, you know, word kind of gets around about this this person, but they don't know it was him. Uh, he's still working from this pi private company who who set up the mission in the first place, and he and his crew end up going up on six, sixty minutes. But there's also in some internal tr strife because of this company is a big kind of conglomerate, so there are people on the outside and, and a couple within who don't really like how things are or some of the things this company is doing. One of which, on kind of on the outside, is the main character's brother who kind of takes issue with you know the way that the interview was, uh, went down with that his brother was a part of. Um, but also the main character whose name is Ramon kind of gets into a little bit of, he kind of does a, almost an MCU Spider-Man thing in which, in which he kind of goes out and tests out his power powers and everything doesn't go completely right. And agent 70 kind of said it earlier, believe it or not, which made me remind, which reminded me of, um, greatest American hero. Bro. Yeah. Yep. Or Ripley's Believe It or Not. Or that, but yeah, but my, but I went to, um, you know, Greatest American Hero, which you can kind of see a little bit of that in there as the, you know, because that is the, you know, for certain of folks of us of a certain vintage, <laughs> that's yeah. where stuff like that kind of comes, comes out, comes up first um, in, in situations like that. But nevertheless, like I said, the, the story in itself is con continuing to be kind of interesting, even if the art's a little, you know, a little hard um 
at times. So I don't know. I will keep up with it for another couple of issues to kind of see uh, if it continues to move me. As I move on to the next book that I talk about, which is Ultimate Bl uh, Black Panther number two, which I know Agent 70 has not had a chance to read. I will not spoil for it, but he's seen the cover, so this this won't be a spoiler in saying that, um, uh, yeah, we meet up with um, Killmonger and uh, Storm. Although, if coming out of that last issue going into this one, you're going to be like, wait, what? <laughs> so did I did, did I miss an issue where some where where there was a formal introduction or something or maybe a, maybe not I don't know, but regardless, but yeah, T'Challa excuse me T'Challa ends up meeting up with uh, Killmonger and Aura or uh, Aurora, which also there was a question there which I won't bring up but it's in my notes. Um, so I was like, wait a minute, what's going on with that part with that? Um, but they end up taking T'Challa. Uh, somewhere and they end up um uh well we find out a few things put it this a, a couple of things um a, about the characters and we don't find out a thing about one particular character which is i have a question about but um i would have to ask the writer of this particular which uh particular issue which i guess i forgot to mention which is uh ryan hill is writing this art by Stefano Caselli, color artist David Curio, and letters by VCs Corey Pettit. Um, we also get some stuff on the side with Shuri and Okoye, of um, which they have, you know, some things going on with themselves. And um, yeah, that's pretty much that. Uh, like I said, I don't want to spoil it, uh, spoil anything for uh, Agent 70 for whenever he gets a chance to read it. Uh, next up is Black Widow and Hawkeye number 204. Nope. Written by Stephanie Phillips, art by Paolo uh, Villanelli, color artist Mattia uh, Icono, letters by VCs Josepino. So, um, basically in this issue, um, an assassination attempt on Hawkeye's life, who is pretty much being hunted down because of something he may or may not have done, um, pretty much takes the, takes them to a trip to the past into um, into Natasha and Clint's uh, you know history. It's also a history we may not have seen of theirs before. At least I don't remember seeing it. Like, say early on before. Uh, and being introduced to Iron Man, Iron Man, or around such, um, and things that's going on there, and in the current uh, and in the present, apparently the we find out who is hunting down, who is the one who put the hit out on Clint, and it's someone that Natasha and I believe Clint knows from one of her, um, um, oh, um. I guess more recent but older volumes uh of her of her book uh next up darkwing duck justice week justice ducks number two right what is this Bring the cover sorry folks um written by roger langridge um, art and colors by Carlo Laro and letters by Jeff Eckleberry. So, um, let's see. Space travelers, um, and an adversary from said space travelers, um, periphery and the justice ducks all kind of line up and, and meet together, uh, in this issue. Gizmo Duck gets some new upgrades thanks to a, a new lab assistant. Um, that end up coming in quite handy in this, uh, in this issues caper. And we also find out that the justice Lux, you know, while still a capable team don't necessarily have contingencies for every, um, this <laughs> is for every adversary they meet, put it that way. Um, and that folks is it for me. Clicks of the week. Clicks of the week.
Uh, you got your your uh, potentials? Yeah, I've got my candidates. So Nightwing number 113, a.k.a. Legacy number 300, mm -hmm. as well as I'm leaning towards Avengers Twilight. I really did like that issue. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in it. Um, and... You know, I enjoyed Spectacular Spider-Man number two, but it just wasn't there. So I think I'm going to stick with my 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 initial two candidates. Mm. Okay. Um, for myself, I think I'm with you on Avengers Twilight. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Actually, yeah. If if I had, I guess if I had more than a, a couple, I liked but and hated Roxxon presents uh thor number one mm -hmm. like what it's trying to do it does well but in that it kind of makes you not like how it, what what happens in it so right. good on them for that you know um spectacular was 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 also pretty good but yeah i'm, I'm i think i'm kind of with you on that it's like yeah it's good but i can't put it up there as a as a click although yeah, anything could happen in and this um and i know what you're thinking hey he didn't mention star trek hey it's just generally generally good but there's nothing really you know groundbreaking that that uh that happens in it that, that would make it stand out you know any more than its usual quality goodness so do you have a do you have have you made a choice yet because i think i'm going to actually go with avengers twilight number five um Oh, okay, well, if that's your final uh, vote. We'll, yeah, we'll, final answer. Yeah, we'll put it in the books. Um, yeah, I'm with you on that one, honestly. Because like I said, um, yeah, especially with that one part with, with, with <laughs> I don't know why. Sometimes, sometimes it's the moments that happen in the book that just makes it for you, you know, whether uh, outside of the book, outside of the whole book in itself, you know. So mm -hmm. you got to kind of take it for that. So that is uh, Avengers Twilight uh, number five of six uh, that we have for clicks of the week. And with that, we go on into the news section. But first, an ad read. Our first ad read of the night is for Blue Apron's meal delivery service. Blue Apron. Fresh ingredients and incredible recipes delivered weekly to your door. Skip the grocery store and make incredible meals at home with Blue Apron. Always ship free right to your home. And now the listeners of the Comic Book Chronicles can get $30 off your first Blue Apron order. To place your first order with $30 off and to help keep our show free for you, go to our network website at cspn.us. That's cspn.us. Then click on the Keep Our Podcasts free link at the top of the page. From there, scroll down to the Blue Apron link and sign up for your first order. Blue Apron through CSPN.us. Do it today. Now we get into the news. And we start off with cinematic news as we do. Um, Mufasa the Lion King confirms surprising character return for the prequel. Um... So, uh, yeah, apparently Moonlight director Barry Jenkins uh, has made a prequel to Disney's live-action Lion King focusing on the origins of Mufasa. Yeah. Um, according to this article, article, as wild as it sounds, no part of that sentence is made up. Uh, um, Mufasa the Lion King will hit theaters in December utilizing the same CG technology as Jon Favreau's 2019 take on The Lion King. Uh, the film is set to show how Mufasa rose to uh, become the king of the Pride Lands, as well as how his relationship with Scar, Scar became so complicated. And this was uh, presented at one of the many things that was presented at uh, CinemaCon 2024, of which we will hear some about uh, in the news section. Next up. Uh, after the first footage from Captain America Brave New World was revealed to the world at CinemaCon, Marvel Studios released the first photos of the upcoming sequel through Entertainment Weekly. So we get an image of Cap, Anthony Mackie, walking through a location in plain clothes, but still carrying a shield. But we get another that shows uh, Sam Wilson in his new Captain America costume while speaking with Harrison Ford's President Thunderbolt Ross. Okay. 
He doesn't say, get off my plane. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> or does he say, if this belongs in a museum? <laughs> well, I must say, you, if they did that, it'd be too late because it was already in the museum. <laughs> yeah, right? So, but yes, any either one of those could have could could freely happen. Um, you could also say that's not how the force works, but you know that would be a little little much. Um, speaking of though, Marvel Studios unveils in, yeah, unveils the official logos and titles for the Fantastic Four and the Th Thunderbolts movie, which apparently has an asterisk on it, and people that are causing people some sort of uh madness. Okay. So yeah, this is again coming from a CinemaCon from presentation, uh, Captain America: Brave New World still has the same, you know, well, one still has the same logo and the same name. Um, there we go. If you're watching the video version, you can see the Fantastic Four logo, which almost looks like uh, an, an old '60s treatment, but also Funko. So, and of course, we get uh, the uh, the Thunderbolts. Uh, logo which has an asterisk, which actually has an asterisk on the, at the end of it for reasons that we still don't know why. For no one knows right. why, right? The mystery remains, right? Although you know, classic uses of uh, of an asterisk means that. So wait, so this is not actual, or this is, or this is a footnote that it's going to come later. <laughs> you know, the, any classic reasons of using a, an asterisk is somehow there. Because the mysteries are there. We'll find out at some point. But the, the Fantastic Four logo. I don't know. I look at it. It's got a, it's got a feel to it. I kind of, yeah. Like you said, Funko is definitely on point. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes along with the, um, the images that we have seen from that movie. You know, with them doing the cartoonized um, uh, illustrations. So it kind of still fits in that vein. Next up. So in kind of unfortunate news. Layoffs are occurring Monday at Marvel Entertainment in New York and Marvel Studios in Burbank. Around 15 people will be affected, including junior-level employees in production and development, the Hollywood Reporter confirmed. No further layoffs are anticipated beyond Mondays. The layoffs come as Marvel refocuses its slate after a content boom as it ramped up to produce numerous films and TV shows a year to feed Disney+. Plus. As part of the pullback, the studio just has one film opening this year, July's Deadpool and Wolverine, and is expected to have just two live-action TV shows this year. Uh, Disney CEO Bob Iger telegraphed in recent months that he expected Disney as a whole to lower its output and refocus, apparently, on quality projects after several misses at the box office. Yeah, layoffs, not cool. Uh, layoffs yeah. were apparently also partially due to efficiencies created when Disney folded the consumer products-focused Marvel Entertainment into Disney's larger business units. There's there's many things that you could say about that that you know, like you just ever saying yeah, layoffs are never a good thing. But that's all I'll say for right now. But I could yep. go on a slightly rant about how things have handled in the last few years from with Marvel and stuff like this. So X Men ninety seven creator Bo DiMeo breaks the silence following exit to give context to issue five to episode five. Excuse me. I, I'm going to keep doing that, folks. It's going to the shows are going to be issues and 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 books are going to be episodes for just deal with it um but yeah spoiler alert for episode five of um episode of uh, x-men 97 uh it basically says that hey a lot of questions and so i'll momentarily break silence to answer uh, as he shared a lengthy prose on twitter uh, episode five was the centerpiece of my pitch to marvel in november 2020 the idea being that being to have the X-Men mirror the journey that any of us who grew up uh, on the original show have experienced since being kids in the 90s. Uh, he continues, the world was seemingly a separate place for us where a character like Storm could comment on how skin-based raci racism was quaint in one man's worth uh, from, from season four. Uh, for the most part, to our young minds, the world was a simple place of right and wrong where questions about the identity and social justice had relatively clear-cut answers. And it kind of goes on from there, um, basically saying that uh, you know the perceptions of the world changed after 9-11, which it did, of course. Things weren't so safe some more, more, anymore. And it even, you know, his comments go, on, go up into, you know, uh, COVID. 
uh some of that like i don't want to read the whole whole thing um but it also does says say here that uh um yeah it looks like gambit story was going a specific direction um talk about the crop top and you know like i said uh, he also re mentions stuff like uh 9-11 and tulsa and charlottesville and other you know other other uh terrible moments uh, that that uh that uh, influenced uh, the episode um as it is so but like i said if you want to check out uh you know his whole thoughts on that you can uh check out the uh this article in his in the show notes next up x-men 97 episode 5 lenore zan the actor uh checks on fans and shares a song so this is the uh the actor who uh voices rogue and she posted a song for fans still hurting from episode five spoiler alert and checked in during the to me my x-men podcast good for her yeah yeah that sounds good um but yeah i know i saw i know i've seen somebody who just recently watched that episode like a couple of days ago or or at least a day or so prior to the new episode (laughs) and i and there was and there was kind of it was kind of feeling that I was like, yep, yeah, we all been there. <laughs> we felt it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's a differing levels, obviously, but we're all kind of like, oh, yeah, it really happened. Right. Or as far as we know right now, it really happens. Yeah. Yeah, right. So Disney reportedly wants to bring um, always on channels to Disney Plus. So kind of like a Pluto TV or a Plex type joint or Roku, whatever the case with the streaming channels. Uh, it says the revamped Disney Plus app could soon feature always on channels dedicated to Star Wars and Marvel shows, according to a report from the information. Uh, the channels, which are likely similar to those of the aforementioned services that I mentioned, could take away, uh, excuse me, according to this article, could take away the choice when it comes from picking out what's next to watch or what to watch next. Um, in addition to Star Wars and Marvel, Disney's lineup of channels could feature stations that continuously stream Disney classics, uh, classic uh, animated films or movies from Pixar. Uh, the information reports, uh, even though viewers will find, would need a Disney Plus subscription to tune in to said channels, they will likely continue uh, to contain ads as these other world streaming services does, or these channel places does. So, not according to this uh, article, not much more details outside of what it is uh mentioned including when these could potentially watch while well, uh, launch but you know i wouldn't be surprised put it that way if, if this does actually happen yep next up next up oh uh, wait hold on hold on uh agent 70 sorry i'm the the i just noticed that underneath this article there's a article which i'm teasing agent 70 about this which m2 is right for you apple 2023 buying guide ah uh... Anyway, next up. More like M3 at this point. Right. But this, yeah, I, was, I don't know why it's pointing to this old article uh, or this old video. I but, you, yeah. No, I was about to say, I bet you it's uh, M2 because uh, the M3s still are not out for the MacBook Pros, but they will be soon. Right. And it's an yeah. old video, I think. So, right. right. So, Superman, the movie, uh, this is James Gunn's revamp, finds its Jonathan Kent in Pruitt Taylor Vince. So the actor is obviously that we were, that was previously played by Kevin Costner and you know went out in a, such a bad way stupidly yes <laughs> yeah that was just dumb so uh, Taylor Vince can next be seen in seen starring as a series regular in the Apple TV Plus series Lady in the Lake uh, other TV work includes Netflix's Stranger Things Marvel's Agents of Shield. Heroes Reborn, NBC's Heroes Reborn, True Blood, The Walking Dead, The Mentalist. This guy doesn't ring any bells in my head, so I don't know. Yeah. Like I said, when you said a couple of them, I'm like, huh? Really? (laughs) Yeah, strictly. I don't don't recognize this dude. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, And also, we got, um, we find out that uh, the Superman movie has Martha Kent also in the form of uh, Neva Howell, I believe is her name. Yes. Um, this, uh, Howell. Yes. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 that's going on with the. I need to know what she's been in. Uh, here we go. Diary of a. 
Oh, this article basically goes on to say, hey, this is why she's a, 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 a good Martha Kent because of some of the motherly figures that she has played in, but it doesn't say much on what people would know them in. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, next up. All right, so it looks like they're they're definitely skewing older this time around. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Transformers and G.I. Joe crossover movie is officially happening. Oh, good Lord. Yep. Following a tease during the ending of Transformers Rise of the Beast, Paramount has officially confirmed at CinemaCon 2024 that a Transformers and G.I. Joe crossover movie will be released in theaters in 2025 or 2026. While we don't, we did not actually learn anything about the movie. It was confirmed that Steven Spielberg will be an executive producer on the project, and Lorenzo D. Bonaventura, Mark Varadian, Michael Bay, Tom DeSanto, and Don Murphy will serve as producers. Goodness gracious! If this had come out back in like the mid '80s, I would have been all over it. But then the tech would not have been able to uh, pull off any of this stuff. So. I feel like, and going into another article that is coming up next, actually, or the next couple of articles, I feel like we still got the better deal uh, of with what Transformers movie we got then. I will say that much. Right. Uh, but yeah, this was, this was, yeah, it was inevitable. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I'm going to actually take these next two because they're related. Transformers 1 first footage reveals a youthful, rather lighthearted origin on the Optimus Prime and Megatron, and I hate it okay um because yeah the 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 trailer came out a couple of days ago i think um yeah it was on the 18th it was on thursday actually when we would have uh recorded and as i as i have likened it it's kind of transformers by way of pixar and that super mario movies uh super mario brothers movie of recent that's what it feels like to me but it's like, yay, this is before they, they they had the ability to transform. Great. This is but this is Optimus Prime and Megatron, buddy all buddy buddied and crewed up and getting the hijinks and Yeah. Not hijinks, but yeah. You watch the, the trailer for yourself and make your own assertions of it. But well, I was like, yeah, this clearly was not made for me, and I don't like it. <laughs> voice voice cast aside, I don't like it. I don't like the way this is being presented. Uh, and the second part of this is apparently the trailer is going to premiere in outer space. Um, and it says here that, um, the launch. Yeah. So wait, 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 hold on. So what is launching it? Um, the launch kicks off at 6 a.m. PT with a live stream countdown showing the journey into space. Uh, after one hour of the craft, we will reach its peak at 125,000 feet above the Earth, revealing the trailer with a custom intro introduction video uh, from Chris Hermsworth and Brian Tyree Henry, which I saw it on YouTube, so I didn't have to go to space for this. Um, the event will be streamed from the Transformers movie social account, which I guess it was Paramount Pictures YouTube channel and co-streamed by, uh, Chris Hemsworth on Instagram, which I'm sure that has already happened. So yeah, there you go. Next up. A grim and gritty Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the last Ronin R rated live action movie is in development at Paramount Pictures. Okay. So let's see here. Walter Hamada, the former president of DC Films uh, at Warner Brothers, is developing the project via his 18 Hertz Productions banner. And this is obviously based on the acclaimed IDW graphic novel from TMNT co creators Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. Yep, yep. Which, you know, we knew this was, this has been rumbling around for a while, or you know, for a little while now. So. Not a big surprise there. Um, no, not. Yeah. Speaking of heroes, uh, the hero sequel series has been announced with the original creator, which had this been announced the day of the eclipse, that would have been funny. Yeah. But it was like, a, I think it was like a day or two later. So I don't know. The, uh, but per deadline, the new show will be called Heroes Eclipsed. Uh, heroes Were Born, if I'm not mistaken, was the, the, the original sequel to uh heroes 
uh, that came a couple few years later after that. But this particular one, Heroes Eclipse, is uh, set years after the events of the original series as, quote, new Evos are being awakened and discovering powers that will change their lives, unquote. The revival will feature some familiar villains along with new characters for the new group of budding superheroes to face. Tim Kring, the, uh, uh, the creator of the original series, is writing this series, which I never finished the original Neither heroes. did I. I liked it, but it's for some, somewhere Neither did I. I never got to where the ending was. Right. Then I was like, okay, this is a good premise here. The thing was, was all right with it, and for the time especially, but like I said, never got to it. I think I might have. I might have it up there somewhere. I don't know, but I don't think I got Reborn or watched Reborn either. So because of that. But yeah, there you go. Next up. All right. Next up, attendees of Paramount's CinemaCon 2024 panel were treated to an exclusive glimpse of Sonic the Hedgehog 3, and it included the first look at Shadow and a down on his luck, Dr. Robotnik. And the next story is very much related to this. Go ahead. Hit it. No, I thought I hit it. Oh, Okay. Keanu Reeves joined Sonic 3 voicing Shadow. <laughs> I mean, none of this means anything to me because I was not a, a Sega Genesis person, so I didn't really play Sonic. So, mm. well, Shadow the Hedgehog was basically a, a hedgehog. It was basically Sonic with guns. Okay, so you can kind of see the connection there. <laughs> so, um. Yeah, he had a two, just like kind of Knuckles did. But yeah, um, the, actually, funny enough, I just watched the first uh, Sonic the Hedgehog movie last night. Okay. Um, for some odd reason, because I was like, am I gonna watch some anime or am I gonna just go ahead and get this uh, Sonic thing out of the way? Because I know that that Knuckles show is supposedly coming in the next couple of days for some strange. I, I'm, and this news had me slightly kind of curious, but yeah. Paramount Pictures officially confirmed Star Trek origin movie for its upcoming film Slate. Um, I believe this is not the Tarantino joint, joint thank goodness. Um, but yeah, earlier this year it was reported that Paramount Pictures was developing a new Star Trek film, feature film uh, in parallel development to the Star Trek IV sequel to 2016's Star Trek Beyond. Today, the studio made, or when this article was uh, put out on the 11th, uh, made reports official as they announced I mean, their slate of films for 2025 and 2026. An official list, which includes what Paramount is now calling, quote, untitled Star Trek origin story. Oh, goodness. Studio also confirms that previously reported details. Um, the film is set decades before the original 2009 film. Toby Hayes of Andor and Black Mirror uh, is directing based on a screenplay by Seth Graham uh, uh, Smith, the Lego Batman movie with JJ Abrams returning as producer. I was about to say, yeah, maybe keep him away from directing <laughs> these also, but you know, um, it, the, the Star Trek movie was just one of many the studio confirmed as a part of the 2025 2026 slate at CinemaCon. There you go. Next up. All right, where am I? Uh, Strange I, New I, Worlds. Ah, Star Trek Strange New Worlds renewed. Lower Decks is unfortunately ending. So Strange New Worlds, currently in production on its third season, has been renewed by Paramount Plus for season four. Meanwhile, Star Trek Lower Decks, the first animated Star Trek comedy, will conclude its run on the streamer with its fifth season, which will debut in the fall of 2024. I was about to take umbrage with that statement, but yeah, I guess it is the first Star Trek comedy. Mm -hmm. Right, because... that's that's the qualifier. It's not the first right. Star Trek animated series. Right, exactly. So I was like, wait, what is it? What are you talking about? But yeah, so this is sad news. I mean, I haven't watched Strange New Worlds, and I hear it's good yet, uh, but I ended up liking Lower Decks, and I kind of wish it had uh, stuck around a little bit longer. But I guess at least it is getting a, a fifth season, so... Eek. Next up, um, speaking of Lower Decks, um, Star Trek Lower Decks may be looking for a new home after the cancellation at Paramount Plus. Wouldn't be the first uh, animated Trek series to move to a different streamer. That's true, because Prodigy uh, also ended up going over to Netflix or something, I believe. Yeah, actually, it is going over to Netflix. So it could happen uh, if, if that's the case, which Paramount Plus, Paramount, it's so all you got to start Star Trek and old Nickelodeon stuff. 
maybe you want to keep some things. <laughs> don't don't be Those WB. Have, well, they have Top Gun. I rest my case. Um, <laughs> but but come on, you know what I'm saying. It's like it, it's Star Trek. It's a bunch of old Nickelodeon stuff. And yeah, they got you know a bunch of and movies, movies. And, right? And yeah. a bunch of movies, but ugh. you ain't got that much. So you might as well keep all your Star Trek Star Trek stuff. Uh, any who's next up. Ah, good evening, aviator. Anyway, I I was getting you know uh, Top Gun, uh-huh. even the new, one. right? Let's see. First look at Nkuti Gatwa's Doctor Who Season 2 confirms the return of Millie Gibson and introduces a new companion. Not one, but two companions. So that's what's going to be happening with Doctor Who. Roddy Cat may be able to better explain this, but um, apparently the first look in photos confirm the return of new companion Ruby Sunday, played by Millie Gibson. And uh, there is... looking for and gibson's going to exit like soon after the first three episodes right and there's another companion that's right. the story which that that's the thing that happens in 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 doctor who you know sometimes it just happens as the new season happens or even with a new doctor what uh, as it gets to be but i guess the 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 news here is who is going to be the new uh companion um it is a uh, Veruda uh, Verada Sethu, aka Sintu, from Andor. So. Who? Oh, come <laughs> on! Oh, mercy! You know who that is? Kinda. She was the she was the one that was all about the all about the mission, and uh, you know. But anyway. Hey, I mean, she's not not a bad looking woman, also. So you know, you know, hey, 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 check the specs. Um, but yeah, that's so that's that. Um, because when I first read this article, I was like, well, wait a minute, why is she still going to be around if this new one, if this new one is coming in? Because that's normally it doesn't always happen that way in in Doctor Who to work. Because usually one goes out at the end of the season, and then the next one comes in, whether it be the Doctor or the companion. So either way, that's you know, Whovians know the deal. Uh, now, no, we're not. Sorry, I was about to say we get into anime corner, but we are not. Legendary Entertainment's live action Godzilla series Monarch Legacy of the Mon- uh, Monsters gets uh, season two season. And I guess that has been confirmed. So, yeah, good news. So, Apple TV announced on uh, Thursday that um, the series. Uh, is getting into the second season. This is a part of a new multi-series deal with Legendary Entertainment that includes multiple spinoffs for the franchise. The main staff is returning for the new season, so I guess um, out of the Matt Fraction and crew. Um, I was about to say, hopefully uh, they signed the, the main cast to uh, to come back also because you know Anna Sawai is going to get a raise because she's Probably gonna win an Emmy. She should she'll get her. Yeah, but I said she should get a raise because of that. Yeah, right. But she's she's almost certainly gonna get nominated for an Emmy for Shogun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I, this article. Watching? What? On no, Hulu? no. Oh. Yeah, because I don't have Hulu, but I've heard I've right. heard people talking about it on FX. Yeah, it's right. really good. Right. So, which you know, I watched the original one. I'm not saying it's the same thing. It's probably a, it's a better. It's far from the same thing. Yeah, yeah. no, but um. I, I don't know. At some point, I'll, I'll get around to it. Basically, um, yeah. All right, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I thought I saw something. It doesn't say it in this article, but I thought I saw another article that basically said that. Yeah, uh, it says here that the main staff is returning, but I still thought I saw another article that says that, yeah, the uh, the majority, if not all, of the the main cast is also coming back. But I'm not uh, not entirely sure of that. Next up. Right. So apparently uh, Godzilla X Kong, uh, new, the, uh, the new empire, had an homage to Godzilla minus one in it in that uh, the director, Adam Wingard, adapted a shot in Godzilla X Kong from something he saw in the Godzilla minus one trailer. So that's interesting that they would be able to kind of cross pollinate like that, you know? 
Right. I was going to see if um, if the tweet actually had an image or something of what, but it just goes to dude about to say something, and I said, nope. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's cool either way. Uh, next up, Godzilla Magnus 1 locks out. Well, okay. Take this for what it is. Um, Godzilla minus one locks down streaming debut in Japan, right? Because half of the the um, places I've seen, actually, probably ninety percent of the places I've seen is recorded, uh, reported, doesn't say that up front, which I hate when they do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's either false advertising, yeah. right? It's, it's either it, right. It's either three uh, paragraphs and not really saying nothing. <laughs> or you know just not getting to the point one way or the other I'm like all right just but either way yeah um according to amazon prime in japan um people will be able to stream it on what is it may 3rd again in japan but i mean that could go the way of saying it could come over here at the same around the same time or something like that or shortly around that time but that's his speculation, or, or you know, on this part, or as of right now. But also, if you have those three magic letters and Amazon Prime, hey, you could also watch it on on May third yourself. Yeah. All right, next up, uh, animated Avatar movie follows adult Aang. Uh, plot details and voice cast reveal. So Paramount reveals the cast and title for Aang, The Last Airbender's next animated movie, and teases what's in store for an older Aang after the show. Okay. I did not do any anime uh, uh, corner stuff for this. That's okay. We're not. T- 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 well, we're not there mm-hmm. yet. We're kind of not there. The next one, yes. All right. Although some people say, you know, it's anime adjacent. We're not going to go through that again, but, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I think this is taking place before Korra um, and after the Avatar the Last Bender, of which I still say Agent 70 should watch because it's good. There's even a little Filoni uh, thrown in there. At the oh, way. really? Yeah, because I apparently, and I forgot about this. So, Filoni actually got his director's teeth, uh, cut his director's teeth on this episode, on this uh, series. He did like eight Dang. episodes. Oh. Yeah. Um, now granted, like there's three seasons and they're like interspace, you know, just kind of space out or whatever. But yeah, I totally forgot that Filoni got to start directing on, on this one on, on Avatar. But it's either that aside though, Avatar is great. Avatar is a good series. I, I you know, I, I, I will, I'm not going to die on that heel, but I'm just saying it, it is. <laughs> and anime adjacent. So if you want to put that on the list or near the list somewhere, you could do that also. Um, also, this apparently they've, Batista is still getting work and he's going to be voicing the villain in this um, uh, animated movie. And I think there was a couple other names. Good for him getting work. I guess. Um, <laughs> I'm not crazy about the dude. I don't know why. I don't know what is about him. Um, Dion Kwan, Jessica Matten, Roman Zaragoza um, will also join as Toph Katara and Sokka. Um, let's see. Dante Basco is set to return to provide the voice of uh, now Fire Lord Zuko. So there you go. Uh, Dante Basco, some would uh, know as the original voice of Zuko, but also um, from Hook. <laughs> right. I forget uh, his name, the character's name. Oh my God. I know. Because every, every other time I hear somebody mention Rufio. his name, they said it Rufio. There you go. They always say that. Mm-hmm. There you go. Next up, we could do get into some anime corner. Alrighty. <sighs> um, One Punch Man movie recruits Dan Harmon. I, I shouldn't say that like that. The One Punch Man movie recruits Dan Harmon and Leather. Uh, Hell, Leather, Heather, and Campbell. Um, so yeah, it says, yes, you've read right. The co-creator behind Rick and Morty is working on One Punch Man. Uh, the writer along with Campbell has been brought in to rewrite the movie's script. Uh, back in 2020, it was announced that Scott Rosenberg and Jim, Jeff Pinkner were heading up the movie script. So now it seems like the story is coming down to Harmon and Campbell. So yeah, I, I don't 
my first when I saw this, I said, "Why? Why? 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 Why?" But you know. anyway, next up. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. All about right, it. next up. So forgive me. This is pronounced code geese, right? I believe that is the case. Yes. Okay. Why don't they just spell it as geese, like like the plural of goose? But anyway, code geese. <laughs> Jose of oh, the man. Recapture anime reveals new key visual and more cast. The four-part film project debuts on May 10th in Japan. So ahead of the theatrical premiere in Japan next month, the official website and accounts for the Koji's Kogis Rose of the Recapture anime revealed a key visual for part one, along with new character and cast details and nightmare designs for the upcoming four-part film project. Wow, four parts. Yeah, really. I know I have known a couple of people who like Code Geese, and I think I've watched maybe an episode in the uh, at the beginning of it. I'm like, I'm not entirely sure what's going on here, but okay. <laughs> One of these days, I get around to it. Next up, go. um, I believe we are in. Wait, did I feel like I skipped one? Nope. Yep, we are in Manga Corner. Uh, this solo leveling. Oh, it is. <laughs> This solo leveling spinoff is ready for an anime um, adaptation. I won't go too far into it, but basically there was a sequel to solo leveling called Solo Leveling Ragnarok, Rock, which we might have actually talked about previously, um, that picks up years after the original series and I think has something to do with the main character of Solo Leveling's son, if I'm not mistaken. Um... And I won't go so far. Dude. I'm sure there's somebody out there be like, yeah, da, 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 da. But I haven't read it. And I haven't even finished the original one yet. Uh, so, yeah. But yeah, apparently, according to this article, hey, they could they could totally make it, uh, make it an anime out of it. And they probably will at some point. Don't you worry about it. Next up. Fans are waiting the solo leveling experience on their consoles. Still have some time to wait, as it's been revealed that the earliest solo leveling arise console release window is currently set for 2025 so uh the lead of development at netmarvel uh for solo leveling seong kyun jin uh revealed to dengeki online that 2025 was the earliest window for the release of arise when asked how arise has improved since its preview in 2022 he highlighted he highlighted cross-play support adding it would have been best if we could have released the console at the time, the console version at the time of the official release, but they decided to release the PC version first. Okay. Right. I saw something on this recently and I went to go check in on if there was something playable out there and I thought I saw somebody playing it, but I don't know. I don't know. It was to be continued. Get a first mm-hmm. look at the gorgeous new comic from, oh, well, we're now we're in the comic news. Sorry. Um, Get a first look at the gorgeous new comic from the team behind Die. So that's Kieran Gillen uh, and Stephanie Hans. Okay. Yeah, they're teaming up on a, according to this article, more sumptuous, terrifying story. We call them giants, which is the name of the book. Uh, there's a quote here from Gillen. Uh, After we finished Die, we knew we wanted to do something completely different. Rather than a sprawling, ongoing, do something smaller, intimate, self-contained, and really pure. So in the middle of COVID lockdowns, I was left alone with my cats staring at them, staring at me and thinking about the miracles for relationships between beings of completely different kinds of intelligences and the wonder to jump across that gap. Uh, the image of the feral girl and the devastation and the giants came up quickly after that and we were away. And I guess that is, uh, yeah, that is that. And you can see if you're watching the video version, the, the cover, I guess the first or a, First cover of uh, we call them giants. Next up, I didn't get a chance to hit the transition. <laughs> In an exclusive, Marvel has revealed a first look at Doctor Doom's final journey. So this is a first look where Marvel shared pages from the upcoming Jonathan Hickman, Sanford Green, former guest of the show, uh, Doctor Doom one shot, which tells the story of Doom's final battle. So um, this is set to come out this May um, in Doom Number One, a story set in the near future by writer, co-plotter Jonathan Hickman and artist co-plotter Sanford Green, where Doom is forced to take on Galactus with the fate of the Marvel Universe on the line. Okay. 
I was about to say, wait, is Galactus got beef because of that one time he stole uh, Doom stole his um <laughs> stole his powers or something? Yeah, or something. Yeah. So we'll find out when we read it. Peter Parker, spoiler alert, Peter Parker becomes a uh, spider goblin in Amazing Spider Man number fifty. Which we, we saw this coming. So just <laughs> They haven't really touched up on it in the last couple of issues, but we saw it coming. Unless they did it in the last issue that I still hadn't read yet. But um, it says here, yeah, Peter Parker carries the weight of Norman Osborn's sins, if you, in case you forgot that was a thing that happened, uh, mm-hmm. and takes to the skies as the Spider Goblin. Do not miss this mind-blazing moment in Peter and Norman's heavy history when Zeb Wells and Ed McGinnis and Todd Knock kick off an all-new Easy Bean Green arc in next month's uh, Amazing Spider-Man 50. And you can check out the cover for uh, episode, for issue number 53 in this article. Uh, I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll see. (laughs) That's all I can say. Next up. Marvel has rounded out the trio of X-Men spin-off announcements with NYX, a revival of the cult favorite early aughts limited series, which introduced Laura Kinney, the second Wolverine, into Marvel Comics. First two X-Men spin-offs announced this week were for the upcoming From the Ashes era were X-Force and The Phoenix. So now we get the revived NYX, written by Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing, a former guest of the show. Uh, with art by Francesco Mortorino. And like before, the story will focus on young mutants making their way in the big city. Laura Kinney, who is going to return to NYX, the book central POV will be played by Kamala Khan, of course. And um, let's see who else. Alongside them, it will also feature Anoli, Prodigy, and Sophie Cuckoo, just one of the five separate Cuckoo quintuplets. Which I guess that means... The- the cuckoos or this one particular cuckoo made it out of uh <laughs> no but this is the cuckoo that, that that's tied in with quentin choir i think uh, yeah so by they're differentiating her from all the others right i mean but still but I'm like i don't think we've seen much of the other cuckoos uh in the cook oh, we have recently but right and prodigy's running around with the dead x-men right now so right. we'll see how that goes right should you've read the original in my ex no Okay. Well, here and there, here and there, but I don't remember much of it at all. Okay, well, there goes my next question. In Jed McKay and uh, Ryan Stegman's X-Men, Cyclops reunites uh, Mutant Revolution. Let's talk about a revolution. Uh, so, yeah. It's, it's some. Um, this is basically the, the Marvel article about uh, the relaunch of X-Men um, with Jed McKay. Uh, let's see. No longer living under the protection of Krakoa. It's a dangerous time for mutants everywhere, and dangerous times call for radical actions. Cyclops gathers a group of his most trusted and reliable mutant soldiers, along with the brightest of the next generation, to tackle the most uh, most prevalent threats to man mutant kind. Excuse me, including an existential new enemy that rises out of the remains of Orcus. So I guess they didn't stamp all of it out, which I guess we knew that. Um, given one thing that I remember reading. Right, uh, prepare for a reckoning as this team handles explosive mutant specific issues without restraint. Humanity can hate them all they want as long as they fear them. Haha, <laughs> I see what they did there, Marvel. You did there. Um, yeah, so that's that. You can read the rest of the, this uh, Marvel article uh, for that. <laughs> that's wild. So they're based out of Alaska now? Right, which we talked about. I think that's where that um that Sentinel base from that was in uh Avengers. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. I which, mean, are they out there, you know, drilling for oil or something? Well, I mean, hey, well, I mean, just saying. Scott is from Alaska, so I guess that in some way it kind of makes sense. I guess, but outside All of right. that, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right, legendary X Men writer Chris Claremont. Tells his wildest untold adventure yet in Wolverine Deep Cut. Okay, so uh, this is the latest retro pick X-Men series coming this July. So uh, Claremont is back with artist Edgar Salazar for this story. And it's a return to the period when the X-Men were operating out of the Australian Outback. Okay. Hmm. Deep Cut. 
I wonder who's going to be involved in the story that we haven't clearly seen any of uh, uh, recently. I mean, the the cover of the first book, the first issue, kind of spoils it just a touch. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit. If you're watching the video version, you can see what I was uh, what I'm alluding to. <laughs> Next up, uh, Sea Werewolf by Night's Ferocity unleashed like never before in a new Red Band comic series. Um, so yeah, following Blood Hunt, Marvel Comics continues to publish Red Band material this August with Jason Liu and Sergio Davila's Werewolf by Night. Um, and apparently it can only be told in Marvel's new Red Band format. So in Werewolf by Night, Jack Russell's new uh, solo ongoing series will be written by the aforementioned creative team. Um... Uh, Marvel's premier horror icon will undergo a startling transformation during Blood Hunt that will cause his upcoming battles and hunts to be too graphic for some readers. Mm -hmm. Labeled with a parental advisory and polybag to keep those weak of heart from experiencing its its, 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 its intensity. This is the Marvel article, by the way. You need to know this. Um, Werewolf by Night will mark a new chapter in the Czech character's 50-year storytelling history as Jack gets his Claws, fangs, and fur soaked, uh, blood soaked like never before. Spooky. Okay. There's the cover. Very spooky. Ooh. Next up. Electra dishes out vengeance in Madripoor for Daredevil Woman Without Fear. So this July, Electra headlines as Daredevil once again in an all new series by Erica Schultz and Michael Dowling. So this is spinning out of. Uh, the Solid Knockman and Eric, Aaron Cooter Daredevil run. So now this is a solo adventure um, for Electra Daredevil. And um, scanning this. Uh, let's see here. So apparently, this is coming out of events that are going to. Uh, that that are going to happen in July's Daredevil number eleven mm-hmm. that pushes Electra towards this adventure in Madripoor. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I'm sure when you get to that point, you will talk to we will talk about that as you read. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I was about to say, and I'm sure sure we'll probably see Miles, but I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> because if it's a set in Madripoor, I doubt there would. That was going to happen. Anyway, um, did Marvel Studios boss Kevin Feige personally ask for the comic book death of Miss Marvel? One writer says yes, but Marvel denies it. And actually, that last part was was tacked on to this after the fact. Because <laughs> this was not that was not originally on this article. Um, but during an appearance on the Amazing Spider-Man podcast, a Spider Talk podcast, excuse me, Cody Ziegler, who currently writes both Miles Morales' Spider-Man and Deadpool comic book series for Marvel, um, and of course his work on She-Hulk Attorney at Law, um, talked about his relationship with current Amazing Spider-Man writer Zip Wells, aka the man who killed Kamala Khan. Yeah. That is this that is this article saying all of that. Um Quote, it was funny watching when the whole Kamala stuff was going down, Ziggler said, explaining that Wells had, quote, told me months before the plan, which was Feige was like, hey, I don't do this very often, but can you please do this to, to make things line up in Marvel because we have some stuff we want to do with Kamala. So he, Wells, was like, fuck, uh, I'm the guy who that threw the short straw. People are going to be very mad that I have to kill Miss Marvel. Okay, I'm going to just stop right there and say, right. <laughs> I'm not going to say something like that couldn't happen. That's not a, as far as we know, a normal thing that would happen. Um, part of me is like, wait, was it because Iman Vellani was was going at you so much where you decided to do that? Uh, if if that happened, Feige, we're on to you, Feige. If that was the case, no, it probably was not. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I feel like this is. They're, they're doing this. This is because this is me conspiracy thing. And so don't take this any kind of way outside of that. This is, this is them taking the heat off of Zeb Wells for that bullshit. I, I feel like there was probably some, there's some, there was something, there was some reason why they chose to do that. I feel still feel it was stupid. Mm-hmm. 
but and we can go back to that but well i won't because you know time is against us at this point but i feel like this is just letting them off the hook <laughs> by putting it on by, by trying to you know laying it out this way but also yep. marvel is saying that well marvel denies it but you know it could be true and they could deny it but it could very well be that what i feel what happened we don't know take it how um, you feel it folks next up Next up, Giant Size Silver Surfer number one has been announced by Marvel. Uh, in a story written by our very own at Tim Dog 98 Timothy Adams, Marvel continues its celebration of its Giant Size comics with a new one-shot starring the Silver Surfer, helping to mark the 50th, 50th anniversary of Marvel's Giant Size line of comics. And uh, Silver, Giant Size Silver Surfer number one is written by Matt Groom with art by Tommaso Bianchi with a cover by Brian Hitch. A comic guest stars Terax Tara- the Tamer. Okay. Hmm. I have not yet read any of those giant size books. Um, uh, I read the Gwen one. Yeah, uh, no, I remember one, that. I, I skimmed very quickly. Yeah. So, the Gwen know. one has a lot, had a lot more to do with like what's going on in the, the current books, but I think the Hulk one that's out this week also has stuff that is related to the current books. And I believe most of them do, if I'm not mistaken. Like, there, there's... But I, like I said, I haven't read them to, to, to find that out for certain. Anywho's, uh, Jonathan Hickman and Eastside Ribix, uh, Aliens versus Avengers. Oh my God, it was bound to happen. Pits the extra uh, terrestrial against Earth's mightiest heroes. We knew it was going to happen at some point. All right. Uh, this summer, Marvel Comics is bringing fans uh, a battle of the ages when aliens and the Avengers face off. The, the upcoming Aliens versus Avengers comic series, which is which was written by the creative team I just mentioned. Um, this is the latest comic in Marvel's 20th Century Studios in print, the first crossover of Marvel and Aliens. Horror part epic is set in a new timeline many years in the future and features older, grittier versions of Marvel characters. Uh, it would also be the first time readers will see certain parts of Aliens lore in the Marvel Universe, like the home of the engineers. Uh, in this, according to this Marvel article, unmissable series, Xenomorphs reach Earth and the perfect organism meets a planet of superhumans. But who will be the first to fall? Dun, dun, dun. Next up. Namor. Jason Aaron dives into the secrets of Atlantis with a new eight-issue series that explores never-before-seen sea kingdoms as well as the dark events that shaped the Submariner's life in the eight issue series in, in, in eight issues, I'm, I'm very much intrigued because it's one, Jason Aaron, mm-hmm. two, it's an eight issue series. So there is going to be a finite a number of issues in this. And I'm actually very curious to read this now, mm. knowing that it's Jason Aaron. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I guess this is the, also the new norm for, Marvel also because like it's not like this is the first extra limited series. I don't know what to call them because maxi series is 12, 12 issues, and I guess this no, is it's just a limited series. I know, I know, I know, yeah. but you know, I feel like but I think as... that. But no, no, I was just gonna say I think that you know they've really been mucking with Namor, and obviously they they gave him that 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 funky costume and. They've always been messing with. They don't know what to do with them. They wanted to change them up a little bit for the Black Panther movie in the wake of the Black Panther movie, hmm. but now they still don't know what to do with them. I like that they're going to take a concentrated effort in eight issues to kind of do something fun or or or, or good, you know, try to tell a good story with Namor. Right. And yeah. I think you know they they pick, uh, you know, by picking one of these writers that has. A, you know, an excellent track record is a good choice. Okay, I, I'm going to. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure about excellent, but that's your that's that, that's your, your your opinion. He's a great writer. I'm not saying he's not. <laughs> he's had he's had a couple of missteps, but that was also early on. Oh so. yeah. Well, I mean, no, I mean, you know, there's like the his Avengers run is okay. Right. I definitely look at. I have you know, obviously look back at uh, Thor, at the at the Thor run with very very fond memories. Right. Oh, I and mean, of course, Thor's. I mean, come on. We're, right. You know, like, right. Like, it's the Thor run that does it for me. Right. You know, like obviously the Avengers run is meh, but um, I think the Thor run still does it for me. So I, I have high hopes for an eight issue series. Right. 
I feel like it will probably be a good story, but I don't think it's still going to do anything for Namor. Because <laughs> as you said, yeah, they did really don't know what to do with them. So, mm-hmm. next up, uh, the hunt for the Jedi for Jedi is on in Marvel Star Wars Inquisitors. Um, and this is from from Star Wars dot com. So yeah, uh, the Inquisitors are going to get a a, a Marvel book. Da, 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 da. Let's see when is it coming? Oh, oh, actually, I should say, uh, new miniseries is kicking off July third from writer Rodney Barnes and artist Ramon Rosanas. Uh, Inquisitors follows the Empire's Jedi hunters as they narrow in on a new target. Uh, Tensu Run, a survivor of Order 66, looking to spread hope and rebuild the Jedi Order. Oh, that's who they're after. Sorry, I just ran that whole sentence. Uh, he has won the attention of Darth Vader, who is determined to have Tensu killed off at one at any cost. The Inquisitor have kind of been uh, here and there in Darth Vader's current run, so makes some sense. Uh, there's a Nick Bradshaw cover for issue number one in this article. Um, including some variants by Alex Maleev and Walt Simonson. And there is a quote uh, from Rodney Barnes saying, it's such an honor to be writing the very first Inquisitor's solo story. I love this time period of Star Wars lore because it's one of the ones I grew up on uh, when Darth Vader and the Empire were imposing their will on the entire galaxy. Plus, I get to create an all-new legendary Jedi with Tenzu Run. Truly the best of times. So, next up. In sad news, comic book and cover artist for Marvel, IDW, and Valiant, Jeffrey Varegi, died at the age of 50 recently after a long battle with lupus. So uh, he was a member of the Port Gamble Esklalam, Esklalam tribe, born and raised on the reservation in Kingston, Washington. He was best known for his use of form line design with pop culture and Native American inspiration, dubbed Salish Geek cover styles, and he worked for... Marvel, IDW, Valiant, Dynamite, Boom, and Dark Horse Comics. He had an he exhibited at the Smithsonian in New York City with his Marvel work for Indigenous Voices called "Of Gods and Heroes: The Art of Jeffrey Varegi." Yeah, lupus being a um, uh, a rare disease for men. Yeah, yeah. So I had a cousin who was not male, uh, uh, passed from from lupus, but not trying to make that about me. Um, but yeah, I remember seeing a bunch of his, his, uh, his, um, uh, of his, of his covers and you know, definitely some, uh, matter of fact, as, as I'm scrolling through, uh, yep. Red Wolf, uh, some Transformer stuff, Sinister War. Yeah. yeah. Some G.I. Joe stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you'll recognize the line work. Absolutely. So you absolutely will recognize the line work as, uh, a Varegi, <clears throat> uh, piece. Yep. So, uh, Thing to be said is rest in peace and um yes. condolences to his family. Definitely. Uh Ramona Freyden's final comic covers will celebrate Women's History Month for DC. Um the variant covers will appear on Wonder Woman number seven, Catwoman 63, and Power Girl number seven, all set for wait, this is old. <laughs> oh, this is way old. Why did I even pick this up? Never mind, because that stuff is already out. It's been out. It's, it's April, folks. Next up. All righty, Marvel Comics 85th anniversary action figures kick off. So this is some Marvel Legends stuff. And uh, I think, you know, one of the things that is going to be most popular is Danny Ketch Ghost Rider with the motorcycle. I'm definitely getting that. When that's up for a reorder, we're also getting... Um, uh, a new Power Man and Iron Fist is like a, a modern Luke Cage with the with the rings and uh, a, a newly uh, remade Iron Fist. So this is like a classic Iron Fist costume with the more modern Luke Cage. It's kind of a weird combo. Mm-hmm. We're also getting, I believe it's a Target exclusive Warbird, which is um, Carol Danvers in her Ms. Marvel costume. I'm definitely getting that. Um, we have Scar, Son of Hulk. The Superior Spider-Man is up, and I'm probably going to get this, too. I tried to get it on Amazon, but they messed up the pricing on the figure, so they have not. So they took down everyone's order, and they're probably going to repost the uh, the posting for it on Amazon so you can order it. You get Astonishing Astonishing X-Men version Wolverine as well. So it's a pretty nice uh, uh, nice batch of, uh, of figures 
glad that it's not like too many, but I'm definitely going to pick up this Ghost Rider. That Danny Catch Ghost Rider bike is pretty cool. I was going to say something about the 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 miss the, the Warbird one, but I'm going to let, let that go. What the bathing suit one? Yeah, I love that costume. That's oh, I mean, costume. I do too. It's not about that. It's about the the figure itself. But one of the images makes it looks like it has a bulge. Oh, that's terrible. That's why I wasn't going to say it, but now that I have, um, <laughs> uh, oh, actually. I'm throwing this in here before I get to the next story. Uh, and Agent 7 already knows where, where I'm going with this. An MCU original just made her comic book debut this week. Um, oh, yeah. Spoiler alerts for, for um, What If um, Venom number three. Um, a certain character comes into play, but not how you think. Uh, if you have actually been on CB Caps uh, at the time this comes up, it, uh, the 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 page uh, where where the the character kind of sort of comes in at um, pops up there. Uh, now then, Transformers Times uh, Robosyn fan stream uh, uh, official Megatron reveal coming April twenty fifth. So in a few days. Uh, it says here, get ready to roll out Transformers fans. Gear up for an exciting Transformers X uh, Robosyn fan stream on the, the on April 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern, exclusively on Habersbro Pulse's uh, YouTube channel. So, if you did not know, Robosyn is the com- uh, company that made that uh, um, transforming auto transforming Optimus Prime and the the uh, the Dino the Grimlock one. So. We are probably expecting a similar thing from this. Is it going to be Megatron t- turning into a gun like he's supposed to? It better be, but it should not. Technically, it probably should be because, you know, current, you know, things going on. But look, <laughs> Megatron was originally a gun. He should continue to be not a tank yeah. uh, unless they're doing Beast Wars version. And even, you know, but that, that I don't think that's where we're going here. Actually, it could be where they're going here, but it, I feel like they would say as much. Um, the the, the it was a teaser trailer uh, on this thing that I had not seen. So next week you'll find out when when <laughs> when we find out about what uh, what what it actually is. Next up, Transformers Robo Sand fan stream official Megatron reveal is coming soon. Sorry, I just April. did that one. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez. <laughs> I wasn't listening. Do you know why? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because I was still looking at the Marvel Legends. <laughs> uh-huh. Isn't that terrible? I was looking uh-huh. at all of the stuff that I was still thinking about ordering. Uh-huh. Okay. Love it. Optimus Prime gets War for Cybertron Earthrise figures from Hasbro. I was still kind of looking forward to doing the RoboSend one. Isn't that terrible? Well, sorry. It's all right. Actually, it's no, all right. not. But <laughs> I want to see. I honestly want to see the visuals of that. Right. That's why it looks like I can't wait till. Like I said, it's well, <clears throat> it's going to be Thursday, so I would like to believe we will. It will, and it's going to be in a more early enough to where I'll be able to pull it. So I'm, I'm sure we will definitely talk about it on next week's show. So this is the latest version. Going back to the the uh, the the news story that I actually was assigned to do. So Hasbro has just unveiled their latest version of Autobot leader Optimus Prime. This is the Earthrise leader uh, WFCE eleven Optimus Prime, based on the hero's classic design from the recent Netflix trilogy. And then there's also another one, Transformers Studio Series Voyager O three Gamer Edition Optimus Prime. These are two versions. Okay. Yeah, the War for Cybertron version and the, the this other version um, as a variant of... All right, so the War for Cybertron version, the the, the leader class is the 5499 one. Mm-hmm. And the cheaper one is the, the Voyager, uh, class. Voyager class, the Voyager, right. Studio Series Voyager. Okay. Yeah, I'm still not entirely sure where the distinction outside of what you just said are, is between some of that stuff because like there's the studio class and there's voyage class and there's leader class and it's like weird all i know is the masterpiece is the is the is the top of the line the top of the line one yes um but anyway and yeah um 
as Agent Seven said, it's the, there's a figure for Transformers One, um, which I believe is that second, the the Voyager class one. So, uh, next up though, Transformers Generations comic books, Shockwave and Grimlock uh, in in hand photos. Uh, there you go. You can see them right there if you're watching the video version. Um, this looks more like a ship than a gun. I am I, uh, uh, for Shockwave. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's normal. I hate to say that's normal nowadays. I know. But Shockwave was also a laser gun. God yeah. damn it. <laughs> Grimlock, however, is looking all right. So, you know. Yep. Next up. That's too funny. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Just, just in. Uh... Oh, that's the pre order. Sorry. There's a pre order for that uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, Transformers collaboration. That, uh, that apparently is a uh, that I am going to be taking a look at after the show. Nick, all right, next up. All right, so this is a little whack. Yes. New Transformers collab turns Optimus Prime into both a real life and collectible race car. Okay, so this upcoming Transformers collaboration will see the release of a new Optimus Prime figure and a corresponding car hitting Japanese racetracks. So guess what, folks? They're making Optimus into a race car when they have literally dozens of Autobots that are race cars that they could use. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're too afraid of creating, you know, of using these quote unquote more or these lesser known or more minor characters. So they're giving Autobot leader Optimus Prime a speedy makeover. Good Lord. I mean, the real life race car looks cool, but guess what? They could have made that, I don't know, Sunstreaker or something, like a new version of them. You are it's a Chevy Corvette. You are not going to hear any argument from me about that. <laughs> and also. Oh, shit, of course that doesn't work. <laughs> no, I tried to set something up and it's not working. Oh, well. Uh, either way, boo. Yeah. That's all I got to say about that. Um, yeah, actually, wait, is this the one I think, um, not only, oh, no, no, this is not that one. Um, or maybe I didn't pull that one. Okay. Cause I thought there was a, there was another one. There was another Optimus that they made as a truck, but it doesn't transform. Hmm. Which is equally as lame. Yeah. That's and I thought, I, and I thought I'll put that in here. I might not have either way. Um, McFarlane Toys brings back the Matrix. So, yeah. I was about to say, no, uh, Sideswipe was the Corvette. Yeah. The Sideswipe? Yeah, Sideswipe Wait. was the Corvette. That's... No, there's more than one side. There's more than one. Well, Corvette. there were there were a couple of sets of twins, remember? Because there was, like, the, the Porsche and the, uh, um, that was, excuse me, the, the two Lamborghinis, technically. Right, right, right. That was Sunstreak uh, and Sideswipe, I think. Right. Um, and... Yeah, there was, there was a Oh, whole... Sideswipe was the Corvette in the movies. That's what it is. Um, I believe Bumblebee was also a Corvette in the movies. No, he's a Camaro. It was a Camaro? Okay, either way. Yeah, that was, that was the more recent Camaro. Right. Okay, yeah. Uh, either way, it's stupid. Um, yeah, but I'm yeah, trying to think of the G1, uh, what the G1 character's name was, because I had him, and I can't remember his name for the life of me. Because he had the the fire the flame bird on the on the um, on the uh, on the hood. You sure you're not thinking about Hot Rod? No, because <laughs> he did have the tracks. On the hood. Oh wow! It was tracks. I totally forgot about that one. Yeah, tracks. I, I had that. It was tracks. Had, really? He had a Corvette. Huh. Hang on. Yep. I'm, I'm yep. Going yep. To... Off to, off to the Googles. I had to send Roddy Cat to the Googles. It's tracks. No, I remember tracks. It's just that yeah. um, I'm pulling it up for folks who, you know. There we go. So that's tracks. Oh, uh, yeah. It was blue. I remember that character and I, I totally forgot that character. All in one swell swoop. Yeah. I had that one. I did not. Because I liked the Corvette. I was like, oh, you know, there's literally an Autobot Corvette, but, you know, obviously, since no one remembers tracks, they're going to make him Optimus, which is whack. I don't think he got much play. No, he didn't. Yeah, mm -hmm. early on he was a, he was around a couple of times, but I, I was you know he, he didn't really get much play. All right, back to action. Um, I, so you so you did the Matrix story, right? Yeah, for McFarlane Toys. Right. Hold on, let's get a price here because I didn't really get to the to chance to finish. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, the non-posable pl plastic figures, boo. But then again, so were most of the first Matrix figures. Part of the current uh, six-inch mo movie maniacs line. They include permanently attached display bases, trading cards and card holders, and a mystery items that tends to be either a sticker or a mini uh, poster, according to this article. It's Neo and Trinity, $24.99 a piece. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Boo. Next up. Nah, see, I've I have i have i I've uh converted Roddy Cat into posing only. <laughs> well <laughs> posing I mean, only figures only. I mean, don't get me wrong, I that's just like that are, are have its place, but you know, but no, nah, I, I I would love something posable. Yeah, I was always like I've always liked something posable. Um uh, anyway, so next up. Skybound, right, so next up, Skybound is crowdfunding to create a mysterious invincible game. So invincible video game, triple A video game. Mm -hmm. Is it, so that's in development. Uh, what does triple A mean? Means that's basically like uh, it's almost like think of it akin to uh, summer blockbuster. Okay, that type, you know, like lots of money, de uh, lots of development behind it. You know, they're, they're going all out with it basically. Got it. But yeah, triple A is usually the name of stuff that they, they expect uh, the, the, to be a, a big blockbuster, big, thing, big things. I gotcha. Yeah, and made by because you know made by big development and whatnot, but apparently this is from Skybound, and, and okay, yeah, they're trying to get the stuff together. Also, according to this article, so they're they're trying to reins, uh, get funds together and whatnot. We'll see. All right, next up, uh, Kevin Eastman back for a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 40th anniversary. Um, it's going to be a 40th anniversary comic special by IDW out on July 10th. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, this also goes into the fact that Jason Aaron is relaunching the, the Turtles uh, comic book after uh, Sophie Campbell leaves with uh, 50. Uh, let's see. Beginning with a spotlight issue on Raphael by artist Joel Jones and a new TMNT uh, number one was Chris Burnham. Uh, here we go. 72 page one shot to be published on July 10th. Like I said, for 12 bucks, which bring will bring back famed turtles creators to revisit past glories, including a new story by Kevin Eastman and a whole bunch of other names that I will not go into. But if you're watching the video version, you can see said names. So, okay. Next up. Two original G.I. Joe members start over in a first look revealed by Skybound. So this is a uh, first look for the upcoming G.I. Joe Real American Hero number 306, which features Zartan, Destro, Snake Eyes, and Scarlet. Okay, um, let's see. So, th so this has art by Paul Pelletier. Oh, that's pretty good. And uh, he's, he's a guest artist alongside, obviously, the series writer Larry Hama. Mm -hmm. And there's a cover for folks. That's a nice cover. And there's another cover for folks. That's Andy Kubert. Yeah. For the, for the Roadblock one? Snake Eyes. No, the Snake Eyes one is, is, oh. is Andy Kubert. The Roadblock one is, I'm not sure who. But uh, yeah, that Snake Eyes one is that's that's a solid cover. It says Brad something on the cover. I'm trying to make it out. Uh, Brad Walker. It's in the it's in the listing yeah. of the selection. Yeah, Brad yeah. Walker and Francesco Sagala. Okay, yeah, I guess if I had gone down two seconds, I would have seen that. Uh, on sale May fifteenth. Yep. Uh, last but not least, Hasbro's former G.I. Joe and Transformers publishing boss launches his new creative development company. Um, let's see. Michael Kelly is the person that they're, they're talking about. Get the name of the company. Might be familiar to some folks who, of the G.I. Joe camp. It's called Extensive Enterprises. No! And I read that. I was like, how can, can, he, can he do that? Isn't there some sort of copyright violation for that? But maybe probably not. I don't probably know. not. Yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, uh, Hasbro's longtime VP of global publishing, Michael Kelly, is betting on himself and launching his own creative development company, uh, which I've already said. Kelly's new company aims to be a creative mind for the biggest companies in the world, or those that want to be, offering development and incubation of inte intellectual property, unquote. Or comic publishers, books, publishers, and any kind of general brand development. <clears throat> So yeah, apparently uh, Kelly's extensive enterprises already has deals in place with the comic strip giant King Features, the toy brand licensor Punky's Playhouse, and the upcoming Paramount animated feature Pierre the Pigeon Hawk, amongst others. So yeah, this article kind of goes into what the, the writer thinks of, uh, of this person, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah. Uh, that's that and with that folks um uh, it just i know there's nothing really to say about that really <laughs> uh we're gonna get into the, our last ad read right our, just before our last ad read i oh, do have a right. little, the toy corner just a tiny tiny toy corner and it, it literally uh came out of the news that came out this week of that new Warbird figure coming out. So that made me nostalgic for the Avengers return or the heroes return uh, part of the, uh, the history of the Marvel universe. And I had, you know, that's, a, that's, a, I have a particularly soft spot for that era of, of the Avengers because uh, that was uh, the Busiek and Perez run. And uh, I am definitely going to pick up that, uh, that Warbird figure. So I actually circled back, to get uh, the recent heroes return iron man off of amazon and i'm probably going to drop my virtual background just to make sure this is visible just for a second just give me a moment there it is look at that there folks it's pretty cool this is the glowy armor sean chen designed uh armor because Busiek and Sean Chan were also doing the um, the Iron Man uh, at that time, so this is you'll recognize this as the cover for the Heroes Return Iron Man number one. And this is the back of the box. It's pretty cool, and that's that. So, bottom line, folks, is um, I, that's going to be a diorama that I put up as soon as I'm able to get my hands on that Warbird because that is a great run. I actually, you know what? Now I have to get, I have to pick up the Justice as well. Come to think of it, I have to pick up the Justice. They don't have a the, that particular costume for Firestar that they gave her for that run, but I think I have to pick up the Justice now. That reminds me, I have to pop on and pick that up. Anyway. Last up, our last ad read of the night is for Amazon. Keep our podcast free by shopping at Amazon. Visit CSPN.us, then click the Keep Our Podcast Free link at the top of the page. From there, scroll down and click on the Amazon link to shop. Purchase items from Amazon as you normally would, whether it's books, music, electronics, jewelry, apparel, or Marvel Legends. For every purchase made on Amazon through our link, Amazon sends the CSPN a payment. It helps us keep the Comic Book Chronicles podcast free for our listeners at no extra cost to you. Amazon.com through CSPN.us. Do it today. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this here show. Um, we'll be back next week. Uh, At our normal some... time next week. Yes, It'll be uh, one of the few times we get to our normal time because life, life's. Indeed, indeed. Um, we did not talk about um, uh, Spy Family because neither one of us saw it. We also did not, neither one of us watched uh, Ka Kaiju 8 number eight for the same reason so uh, maybe a little bit more on at least one of those next week who's to say right um and i know actually wait because i think we got uh demon slayer coming up soon if i'm not mistaken but we're you know hey we'll we'll, we'll get on to that that I being said that, that's may right that is probably the case but may is like next week <laughs> or yeah you know oh, so we we got next, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's that's pretty soon regardless um and with that i have been radicat you can find me at radicat on twitter you can find me at news news need on twitter you can find me at cb caps on instagram uh agent underscore 70 on twitter, twitter instagram and threads uh pc underscore dirt on twitter pop culture network pop culture net on twitter pop culture network.com and zolo zombro sites therein 
And Tim D O G G nine eight on Twitter, CP Cron on Twitter, which is the Gumball Chronicles Twitter account, um, the Click Nation on Twitter, theclicknation.com. And last but never, ever, ever least, he's over at uh, comicbook.com, right in his face off. That's pretty much what most of his dealings is at this point. Um, you could also find this here podcast on the Coast of the Podcast Network. That's uh, CSPN.us. Do it today. You could also find us on your podcast, Peru, the place of choice, whether it be Google Play, Apple iTunes, aka Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the Coast of the Podcast Network SoundCloud page. <clears throat> Make sure to click like, subscribe, and leave us all the positive five star reviews, especially on Apple Podcasts. <clears throat> Your boy's trying to run away with me from me. Um, uh, yeah, you could also find us uh, recording mostly, as we said, every Thursday night, nine thirty Eastern Standard Time, on the YouTube channel of the Click Nation. That's youtubecom slash the Click Nation and twitchtv slash Comic Book Chronicles. Make sure to click like, subscribe, leave us, uh, or hit that notification button so you know when we are on live. And, uh, you know, we could always use, uh, you know, follows and, and likes. Hit, smash that like button. You know how it goes. Yeah, there, there's a game that is all, pretty much all about that kind of stuff. This is called Content Warning. It's kind of funny. Anywho's, um, all right, folks, we will talk to you again next week. I'm sure this show will be out a couple of days prior to it. So hey, you, you get the double dip this week. Uh, and with that, this has been the Comic Book Chronicles. Peace. Peace one. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs>